Hello, young people and youth leaders. I'm Pastor Gary Blanchard, and guess what? Global Youth Day is soon approaching, and all of us here at the youth department cannot wait. How about you? <laughs> the theme this year is loving the forgotten. Can you think of some people from your church that you haven't seen in a while? Is there a widow or an orphan in your community that is inevitably going through a difficult life transition right now? Or maybe some elderly or sick and shut-in member needs your attention and care. Have you spoken to them recently or shown them God's love? Take this time to come up with a plan, a strategy. Connect with them. Send some care package letters for them to know that you, they are loved and never forgotten. In Matthew 25, Jesus reminds us that when we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, visit the sick or those in prison, when we do for the least of these our brothers and sisters, we are doing it unto Him. <laughs> That's what GYD, Young People and Youth Leaders, is all about. Remembering those we may have, unfortunately, forgotten. I love Global Youth Day because it's the springboard for living a life of service. Global Youth Day is not the end, but the beginning of an exciting journey. That's right. Once we have cared for the community physically, we have a chance to also care for them spiritually with a week of prayer. This is your chance to bring anyone who you ministered to during Global Youth Day or any other missing members to learn about Jesus and His life-transforming love. This year's week of prayer is focused on the three angels' messages and how we can share the good news of Christ to all the world. Week of prayer always ends on the next Sabbath with homecoming Sabbath. This is the time to invite everyone we ministered to this past week. On this day, we want to invite our friends who haven't been around recently and celebrate with those who have been chosen by Christ and have decided to be baptized. Yes, what a wonderful time this will be. I cannot wait. Remember to start making your plans now. Check our website, gcyouthministries.org for all the Global Youth Day, Week of Prayer, and Homecoming Sabbath information. And make sure to use your hashtag GYD22 on all your social media posts. And on behalf of the General Conference Youth Department, we love all of you and we'll see you at Global Youth Day. Bye-bye.
Bible friends, this is Aunt Sil, and today I have a very special story for you called Sarah's Baby. Our memory verse is from John 15, 12, and it says, Love each other. Look, this is Sarah. Poor Sarah. She's very sad. Sarah is sad because she doesn't have any kids. Abraham is Sarah's husband. And he's very sad too for not having children with Sarah. But he's even sadder because Sarah is crying. Abraham loves Sarah very much. So he hugs her, he pats her back and tells her, Don't be sad, my darling. I don't want you to be sad. <laughs> Abraham. I wanted to have a baby for so long, a baby of my own, but now look at me, I'm too old. <laughs> oh. Sarah, I know you want a baby, I want a baby too. God said he would give us a son, but now we are so old. But don't cry sweetheart. <laughs> One day. Abraham saw three strange men. They were walking towards his tent. They looked tired, so Abraham called. Hello, friends! You must be tired. Come, come and rest a while. Rest in the shade of this tree, and I will bring you something to eat. The man smiled and said, Thank you, thank you very much. And the three men sat down under the tree. Abraham hurried into his tent to talk to Sarah. Sarah, Sarah, hurry! We have company. Please, bake some of those delicious bread of yours. Of course, my love. I'll do it right away. And Abraham went back to talk to his new friends. When the food was ready, Sarah called for Abraham. Abraham, the food is ready. So Abraham took it to the visitors. While they were eating, one man asked, Abraham, where's your wife? She's inside the tent, Abraham said. So the man said, I will come back and see you next year. And when I come back, your wife, Sarah, will have her very own baby boy. When Sarah heard the man, she could not contain herself, and she laughed. <laughs> Me? Having a baby? At this age? <laughs> the man heard Sarah and said, I heard Sarah laughing. She thinks she's too old to have a baby. But... Is anything too hard for the Lord? Then Abraham knew that man was really the Lord. He had come to visit Abraham. 
After that, the three men left. And one year later, it happened exactly as the Lord had predicted. Abraham and Sarah did have a baby boy. He was so cute. Look at the baby in Sarah's arms. They named him Isaac. His name means he laughs. Sarah and Abraham loved Isaac very much. Your family also loves you very much because people and families love one another. When Jesus in the family, happy, happy home, happy, happy home, happy, happy home. When Jesus in the family, happy, happy home, happy, happy home. Happy, happy home. Happy, happy home. Let's thank God for our families. Dear God, thank you so much for our happy home. Thank you for being in our family and for our loving family. In Jesus' name, amen. May you always remember that your family loves you very much. And Jesus loves you too. Hello boys and girls, this is Anfernita and I have a wonderful story for you called Abram to the Rescue. Today's memory verse is from Genesis chapter 14 verse 24. It says, I will accept nothing belonging to you. The message for today's story is we serve others out of love. Who helps you when you are in trouble or afraid? Abram helped Lot when some enemies captured him. This is how it happened. Abram sat near the door to his tent, enjoying the fresh breeze. Suddenly he stood up and put his hand above his eyes to shade the sun. He could see a man running towards him. Abram walked out to meet him. Oh, Abram, the man gasped. There's been a great battle. The king of Sodom and four other kings went to war against their enemies. The man tried to catch his breath. <sighs> Abram looked worried. His nephew Lot lived in Sodom. What happened? Abram asked. The king of Sodom and the four other kings lost the battle. The enemy kings captured Sodom and another city. They carried away all the food and the gold and the animals and the people. They took your nephew Lot and his family too. You rest here, Abram said. Then he went to pray. He asked God to guide him. Soon after, Abram gathered his soldiers and told them his plan. Three neighbors and their men joined him. They would find the enemy kings and follow them, but they would wait to attack until the enemy had made camp for the night. That night they surprised the enemy kings. The startled enemy kings ran away, leaving behind the gold, the food, the animals, and the people. Oh, uncle, exclaimed Lot when he saw Abram. I'm so glad to see you. Let's go home, Abram said. So the people gathered the gold and the food and the animals and followed Abram. Abram had won the battle, and that gave him the right to keep those people and all their things if he wanted to. As they neared Lot's home, two men came out to meet them. Melchizedek, the king of a city named Salem and a priest of God, brought food to Abram and his men. He blessed Abram and said, God the Most High delivered your enemies into your hand. Abram knew that God had won the victory for him. He was so grateful that he gave God's tithe. That's one out of every ten animals and pieces of gold to Melchizedek, God's priest. The other man, the king of Sodom, said to Abram, Give me back the people and keep everything else for yourself. He knew that they should all belong to Abram because Abram won the battle. But Abram didn't want anything. I didn't go to battle to get rich, he said. I will accept nothing. Abram asked just for the food his men had already eaten and for shares for the three neighbors who helped him. Abram was happy to serve others out of love, and we can serve others out of love, too.
Hello everyone, it's Aunt Fernita. We're studying Lesson 12, Out of Darkness. The message for this week is God will help me share His message of salvation with others. The memory verse is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Akiko squinted several times as she came out into the bright sunshine from the cave she and her class had been exploring at the zoo. It felt good to come into the sunshine and the fresh air. Jonah was so happy to be on dry land again. First, he took some really deep breaths of fresh air. It smelled so good after the fishy smell of the last three days. He blinked a lot. The light probably hurt his eyes after three days inside the fish. He stretched and moved around. How good it was to be able to move freely again. Jonah rejoiced and praised God for saving his life. Suddenly, God spoke to him again. Jonah, I still want you to go to Nineveh. I need you to preach the message I will give you. Jonah still did not want to go to Nineveh, but he had promised God that he would obey him. So he went. Jonah began to preach as soon as he arrived. He told everyone God's special message for the people living in Nineveh. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. The news spread quickly throughout the city. Nineveh is going to be destroyed? How could this possibly happen? What can we do to stop it? Everyone was serious. They believed the message Jonah delivered. Soon people began to wonder, maybe if God sees that we're truly sorry for doing wrong, He will save us. Maybe He wouldn't destroy our city. Let's show Him how sorry we are. We should stop eating food for a while and not wear our regular nice clothes. This will show God that the most important thing to us right now is to talk to Him and to have Him listen to us. So everyone put on sackcloth to show how sorry they were for their sins. They fasted and prayed for forgiveness. The king of Nineveh heard what was happening in the city. He knew at once that Jonah's warning came from God. He believed the message. He decided to show God how sorry he was for all the wicked things he and his people had done. He took off his royal clothes and put on sackcloth, simple, coarse clothes. Then he sat in the dust and prayed to God. The king sent out a message to all the people in Nineveh. No man, woman, child, animal, herd, or flock is to eat or drink anything. Everyone is to wear sackcloth. We need to pray to God urgently. Let us stop being violent and unkind to one another. Maybe God will be merciful to us. Maybe He will forgive us for all the wrong things we have done and not destroy our city. Everyone did just as the king commanded. God saw the people. He could see how sorry the people of Nineveh were. He believed that they were really sorry. So God forgave them and decided not to destroy the city. The people of Nineveh were grateful. God had shown them His love and mercy, and they would change their ways. They began praising God for His love and forgiveness. Jonah had done what God had asked him to do. He had given the message God gave him. God had shown that He cared about the people of Nineveh. He wanted them to be good people. He wants us to care about others too. He wants to use us to share His loving message of salvation with others.
in a world surrounded by darkness, there is a voice that whispers to every young heart, urging them to find the treasure of truth. Those who follow the path will discover eternal riches beyond their wildest dreams. Join us now for an amazing adventure, a journey for life with Jesus. Good evening, friends. Welcome again to Amazing Adventure. We're glad that you've joined us once more. This is the only lifeboat. That's the topic that Pastor Doug will be covering this evening. How many of you have been filling out the lessons night by night after the program? Oh, I see a lot of hands. I hope those of you who are watching are also doing that, filling out the lessons. Are you enjoying the lessons? They're great. We've gotten all kinds of wonderful emails of people saying how much they've enjoyed their lessons. So be sure to use this night after night to remind you of the things that you've heard here at the seminar. Well, I think it's time for us to start with our theme song. We want to welcome the amazing adventurous singers. Thank you for leading us. Let's stand together as we sing. remain standing as we're going to have our scripture reading and prayer at this time. Judith will be bringing our scripture reading. What is the verse that you're reading? Acts 4 12. Nor is the salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we tr which must be saved. All right. Thank you very much. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this nice day. And please bless this program and help it to go well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can all be seated at this time. I'm going to invite Pastor Doug to come forward for Bible questions this evening. We've got some video Bible questions that have come in. So let's start with that, Pastor Doug. Amen. I'm, I'm excited to hear what we've got. Hi, my name is Isaac, and I'm eight years old. Why didn't Satan die in the flood? Isaac's wondering, why didn't Satan die in the flood? Well, I don't think he knows how to scuba dive. The idea is that Satan is not flesh and blood. You can read in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 that when we wrestle against the devil, I mean, sometimes we wish that we could just box with the devil and deal with him like that, because we understand those kind of things. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The devil is a spirit. And they are spiritual battles, and that's why we put on spiritual armor. So a flood that might drown some mammals and a lot of people, it didn't drown the devil. But I believe the world during the flood was in such turmoil that even Satan feared for his existence. Well, Pastor Doug, we've got a question here that's come all the way from Zimbabwe. Melunga is asking, why do we have so many religions? Oh, that's a good question. Now, if you wanted to hide a diamond, you know a good place to hide a diamond would be in a pile of broken glass. When I grew up in New York City, they used to have these telephone booths. And one day, one of the windows of the telephone booths broke. And you ever seen what happens to a car window when it breaks? It shatters into all these little pieces like jewels. And my friend and I scooped them up and we thought, boy, they look like diamonds. If you had dropped a diamond into that pile of broken glass, it would have been hard to find. The devil is trying to hide the diamond of truth. 
in all the broken glass of these different religions. So all of the religions of the world have different elements of truth. Uh, and there's some good things maybe in many religions. But there's only one truth. And the devil is trying to hide it. And so he gets people to fight and they divide and they form all these different religions and denominations to create confusion in the world. The only way to know where the real diamond of truth is, is through the Bible. It must be tested by the Word. All right, well, we have another video question for this evening. All right. I'm Andrea and I'm nine years old. My question is, what, how can we resist temptation? Oh, let me ask a question. How many of you are sometimes tempted? Let me see your hands. Ah, we already knew that. I just want to know if you knew it. Everybody's tempted. You know what? Was Jesus tempted too? Yes. Even Jesus was tempted. Is it a sin to be tempted? No. The devil tempts everybody. And if you are trying to do God's will and you're swimming upstream, the devil's going to try and cause problems for you. How can you resist temptation? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, and I don't have time to go through uh, the whole list. But first of all, Thy word I have hidden in my heart, the Bible says in Psalms, that I might not sin. So store up the promises of God. How did Jesus fight the temptations of the devil? When the devil tempted him, Jesus said, It is written, it is written, it is written. He quoted the Bible because the principles of the Bible were guiding him in his life. Another way you can avoid temptation and not to be tempted is stay away from things that are tempting to you. If a person has a problem with alcohol, they shouldn't go shopping in a liquor store, right? You want to stay away from the things that are a temptation for you. If you've got some friends that are a bad influence, you want to avoid those friends that could cause problems for you. And so there's a lot of things you can do to help resist, uh, to resist temptation. Pray that God will give you strength. Keep your eyes on Jesus as your example. Ask Him to fill you with His Spirit. And say, Lord, every morning, you, you know what the Lord's Prayer says? Lead us not into temptation. Say, Lord, lead me away from temptation. And he will. He'll help you every day. Well, I could talk more about that, but we've got a big program tonight, so I think we better keep moving. Well, Pastor Doug, do we have time for one quick question? All right, let's see. All right, here it is. This is Alexandria. She's uh, sending this question in from California. Here's the question. How did Jesus climb up the mountain of olives? <laughs> I think Alexandria thought the Bible speaks about the Mount of Olives, and maybe she, she thought it was a mountain of olives. Have you ever tried to climb on a mountain of olives? That'd be slippery, huh? A lot of olive oil. And so uh, it wasn't the mountain of olives, it was the Mount Olivet is what it was called. And so that was the name of the mountain. But he walked. It's not a very steep mountain like Everest. Jesus just walked up, but it's more like a big hill. I've been there before. Good questions. And keep your questions coming, friends. If you've got a question or if you want to send us a picture of your group that's gathered, we'll be putting some of them up on the screen. Go to AmazingFactsKids.org and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Pastor Doug. We have a very special treat this evening. We've got the Texas International Choristers who are here with us tonight. And they will be bringing us a special song, We Believe. So we invite them to come forward.
Now, I've been asked to invite Pastor Doug to come forward for something this evening. Pastor Doug, do you know how to play the harmonica? A little bit. <laughs> All right. We're going to invite Pastor Doug to come forward. Something special this evening. This is the Spanish Harmonica Band, and they're going to be playing for us here, and we're asking Pastor Doug to come and join them for this. that that kind of surprised me they gave me a harmonica a few minutes ago and I haven't played in a while but I don't think I threw them off that much <laughs> oh it's so good to see each of you here tonight how many of you have not missed a night oh good job and I'm, I'm hoping there's some of you who are watching from all across the country and around the world and you haven't missed a night yet we're only halfway through this adventure but this adventure is really the launching pad for the biggest adventure in life, which is following Jesus, being a Christian, and giving yourself to Him. Our study tonight, and I hope you're doing your lessons, is the only lifeboat. The only lifeboat. Now, I have uh, been in lifeboats before. My father was in the airplane industry, and I remember going out in the uh, Florida Keys and playing in one of these aircraft lifeboats before, and it's got all this survival gear in it. And I've heard stories of people who have been months out in the ocean in lifeboats, sometimes with friends, sometimes by themselves. Heard fantastic stories. You know, a number of years ago, back in, uh, I think it was 1912, April 14, there was a big, beautiful luxury liner called the Titanic. And everybody thought that the boat was unsinkable because it had all these watertight compartments, 16 of them. But they hit an iceberg on their maiden voyage. And you know what happened? The Titanic went down. The sad thing was they had not prepared enough lifeboats for everybody. And even some of the lifeboats were pushed off half full because people thought the ship's never going to sink. But it did sink. And out of over 2,000 people that were on the ship, over 1,500 died because they didn't have enough lifeboats. You know, the Bible tells a story of a terrible storm that came to the world one time, and there was only one lifeboat to save everybody. Who knows what that boat was? Noah and the ark. God said, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood because man's hearts were only evil continually. And for 120 years, Noah preached and tried to warn people, get ready and get on the lifeboat. But people said, not now, later. It's not that important. And they put it off. And finally, all the animals got on board. Noah stood in the door of the ark and he pled with the people. This is the only way. There's no other way. If you don't get on this boat, you'll perish. But they didn't listen to Noah. And then God shut the door of the ark Seven more days, everything looked normal. People bought and sold. They made fun of Noah because his family was all locked up in the ark. But then the clouds grew dark and the lightning began to flash and the earth began to shake and water started coming down from up above and water started coming from below and shooting up out of the ground. 
And it was a tremendous flood, much more than Hurricane Ike we had a few days ago. This was a catastrophic flood to cover the world and all of the world. You can see the evidence of that. And the people that did not get on the ark did not make it. Well, do you know that Jesus says that there is another storm coming? How many of you know the Bible tells us that? And there's another ark. There's one more lifeboat that you can get on, the only lifeboat. We're going to talk about that tonight in our lesson. It's the boat of salvation. And I want to make sure that everybody here and everybody there who's watching, that you all get on board because it's the only way to survive and have eternal life. Let's go to our lesson. Question number one in our lesson. What has God done to make a lifeboat for us? The answers are all in the Bible. I brought my Bible up here with me because I might think of some scriptures that aren't on the screen, but I've got most of the scriptures on the screen. Most of you know this one. Matter of fact, why don't you say it with me? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Very good. You know that. And some of you weren't even reading it off the screen. God so loved us that he gave his son. You know, when I hear about that, when I hear that love, when I hear about that word, he so loved us, it warms my heart. It makes me want to love him back. I don't think any of us really realize how much God gave when he gave his son. Back in 1937, there was a man named John Griffith, and he was a bridge operator, and he operated a drawbridge that went across the Mississippi River, and he would lift the bridge up, and the boats would go by underneath, and then he'd hear a whistle from the train, he'd lower the bridge, and then the train would go across, and then he'd lift the bridge back up. And one day, John brought his young son with him to work. And he showed him the big machine and the gears and the cables that lifted up the bridge. And his son watched the bridge go down and the bridge go up. And he thought that was really neat. He wanted to go to work with dad and see what he did. So they had some lunch. And while they were sitting there eating lunch by the edge of the bridge, the father heard the buzzer ring up in his booth. And that meant there was a message. A train was coming. So he ran up into the booth and he got on the line and they said that they have the Memphis Express is coming. We've got 400 passengers. Do we need to slow down or will you have the bridge down? He said, I'll have the bridge down. He gave them the green light and they opened up the train and started going real fast. And the man began to do some stuff to lower the bridge and he looked down from his booth and he saw that his son, Greg, had tumbled off into the machine where the cables and the gears were and he was stuck on a piece of cable was catching his clothing. And the father looked. The train had already passed the switch. It couldn't stop now. He couldn't signal them. The bridge was up. If he didn't lower the bridge, all those people on the train would plunge off into the Mississippi and hundreds would die. If he did lower the bridge, his son would die. And he knew what he had to do. And with trembling hands and a broken heart, John Griffith moved the switch. He covered his eyes and he closed his ears so he would not hear his son crying. And the bridge went down. Soon the train went roaring across and some of the people in the train waved at the man in the booth and they didn't know how much he had just paid to save their lives. You know, that's the way it is in this world today. People go on their merry way and they don't appreciate how much Jesus has given, how much he's paid. God the Father gave his son. He loved us so much. Don't you think we could trust and love and serve a God that loves us that much? The only way to be saved is to put our lives in Jesus' hands. Don't you want to do that, friends? More scripture. Jude chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, you know what a life preserver is? If someone's out in the water because they have a man overboard, someone fell off a ship, they used to throw a ring to them to help them float until the boat could turn around. And it was called a life preserver. You know, the Bible says here in Jude, we are preserved in Jesus Christ. He's not only our lifeboat, he's our lifesaver. He's our life preserver. Any of you ever eat those little round candies? They call them lifesavers. Because they were named after those round rings called life preservers. And if you look at the old lifesavers, they even got the little lines in them where the ropes used to be. They won't save your life. They'll just give you cavities. 
But Jesus is a real lifesaver. He is a real life preserver. Question number two. How could Jesus love us that much? Does he really love me? Yes, he really loves you. Matter of fact, you can read in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrated, he showed his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, the Lord didn't say, if you be good, I'll love you and I'll forgive your sins. The Lord loves us and he's willing to forgive us if we come to him just like we are. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been out playing before and you got dirty? And your mother tells you before you come to dinner, she says, look, I want you to take a bath, but you need to clean up before you take a bath. Would your mom and dad ever say, clean up so you can take a bath? Or do you take a bath so you can clean up? Do you know, some people don't come to church. They say, I'm not good enough to go to church. I can't accept Jesus now because I'm, I'm not good enough to accept Jesus. That's backwards. That's like your parents telling you, will you please clean up so you can take a bath? No, you'll never be good enough unless you come to Jesus, just like you are. And then he cleans you up. So the idea that you're going to clean yourself up and you're going to change your ways and then you're going to come to Jesus, that's backwards. You come to him and give him your heart no matter where you are, no matter what your problems and temptations are, and he can change your heart and cleanse you and he'll accept you. He's desperate to save you. Matter of fact, Isaiah 43, verse 4, I like this verse. It says, you were precious in my sight. You're very precious to Jesus. He loves you with an everlasting love, the Bible tells us. There's nothing that you can do that would make God stop loving you. You know, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Because God loves you 100%. And is there anything more than 100%? 100% is as much as you can have. Of course, if you're in government, you can spend more than 100%, but <laughs> you'll learn about that later. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. It says there, there is no created thing that shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Lord loves you desperately, and there's nothing that can separate you from that love. You know how we know he loves us? What's the greatest proof that he loves us? What is it? He died for us. He gave the most he could give. The Bible says no greater love has someone than to lay down their life. What's the most valuable thing you've got in your house? Is it a toy? Is it a piano? Is it a home? The most valuable thing you've got is your life. Matter of fact, there's one thing more valuable than my life. You know what, what I've got that's more valuable than my life? Is the life of my family, my children. And so when someone gives something even more, when the father gave his son, that, would have, that hurt him even more than giving his own life. Years ago, there was a man in Scotland. His job was taking care of this lighthouse there by the ocean. And he had a beautiful view. He could see the ocean on one side and the green fields on another side. And it was his job during the day he'd keep the windows clean and so that the light would shine. And one day he was walking around the outside of the top of the lighthouse cleaning the windows and there was a metal railing that kind of protected him. And he leaned against the railing but he didn't know that the salt air had been rusting the iron railing and it broke. And he fell 150 feet down on the ground. Well, pretty soon he opened his eyes, he looked up, and he saw the blue sky, and he thought, did I die? And then he saw clouds going by, he thought, am I in heaven? And then he noticed that his back really hurt. He said, if I'm in heaven, why does my back hurt? And pretty soon he got his senses, and he kind of looked around, and he had fallen 150 feet. It would have killed anybody, except you know what happened? He landed on a sheep that was grazing there below him. I know that sounds funny, but it's a true story. You know what happened? The man lived, but what do you think happened to the sheep? The sheep, you know, great big fluffy sheep, it died. It gave his life so he could live. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our lamb. John chapter 1, when Jesus came to John the Baptist, it says the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of, who is that? The Lamb of God. And what does he do? 
He takes away the sin of the world. When Jesus died on the cross, He did not just die to take away the sin of one person or two people. His sacrifice was so powerful that He provided enough forgiveness to save everybody in the world from sin. And that would include you. Now, sometimes we think, well, I don't have any sin, do I? We've all sinned, remember? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And you know what we need is we need to see ourselves sometimes through God's eyes. Let me tell you a story. When I was about four years old, that's younger than most of you, my father had a shoe shine machine in the house he used for shining his shoes. And every day before he went to work, he'd take his shoes while they're still on his feet. He wore them just like me. I've ended up just like my father. He would take his shoes and he wore black shoes. He'd step on the button on top of this machine and it would spin real fast and go and there was a black furry brush on one side and there was a red furry brush. I don't know why he had a red brush on one side because he had no red shoes, but that's what it was. And a red brush on the other side. And he'd take his shoes and he'd buff his shoes and then he'd step on the button and he'd go to work. One morning, it was a Sunday, I woke up before everyone else. Dad was sleeping in with the family. And I got bored. Everyone was asleep and I wanted to play and I was awake. So I went out in the hall and I played with the shoe shine machine. I liked to play with it. I'd sit there and I'd press the button, go click, click, and it'd go zzzz. It'd spin and I'd try and stop the brushes, but they were so powerful I couldn't stop them. Any of you ever seen this kind of machine I'm talking about? I saw one in a hotel not too long ago. They still make them. Well, I got bored playing with it. I turned it on, I turned it off, turned it on, turned it off. And then I thought, I'm going to shine Dad's shoes. So I tiptoed in his bedroom and I grabbed his shoes. And I came back out and I closed the door. And I thought, I want to get a real shiny, so I'm going to use some shoe polish. But the only shoe polish I knew about was under the bathroom sink. And so I got the black shoe polish and I went out and I stared at it for a minute. I wasn't sure exactly how it worked. I was only four years old. So I, it was liquid shoe polish. I poured a generous amount of black shoe polish on the black brush. I knew the black shoe polish didn't go on the red brush. And then I turned on the machine. Something terrible happened. First the machine began to bounce because all of the polish had weighted one side of it and it was off balance. It started bouncing, and then it picked up speed of and it would and it sprayed a black rainbow of shoe polish up the white wall, across the ceiling, down the other side. And I quickly turned off the machine, but it was too late. And I looked at that and I thought, I better go back to bed. <laughs> so I went back in my bedroom and I laid in my bed and I, I kind of covered myself up and I thought, nobody saw me, nobody will know. I'll just pretend it never happened. Pretty soon I heard my dad get up and he fumbled around and pretty soon he opened the hall door and he walked out and I heard, what, what, what? <laughs> he came over and he opened up our bedroom door and I had my brother and a stepbrother in the house and yet he knew right away, he said, Dougie. That's what he called me. And I said, I pretended I was asleep. He said, Dougie. I opened my eyes, he said, get in here. So I came in the hall and he pointed to this black rainbow. Did I tell you that it went right through the middle of a Spanish soldier? There's a picture of a Spanish soldier on the wall. It went right, it's like he had a vertical mustache. Went right through him and, and he pointed at the picture. He said, do you know anything about this? I said, he, nobody saw me. I said, no. He said, I'm going to ask you again. You know, your parents almost always know, even when you don't think they know. He said, I'm going to ask you again, do you know anything about this? And once you start lying, it gets easier to keep lying. I said, no. He said, okay, I'm going to spank you till you tell the truth. <laughs> so right there in the hall, he sat on a bench and he began to paddle my posterior. You all know where your posterior is? Your derriere? And he's spanking me and I'm going, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. I did it, I did it. Because pretty soon you get tortured, you all confess, right? Then my father sat me down. He said, now Dougie, he says, I'm not spanking you because you made a mistake. I'm spanking you because you lied. He said, get in the bathroom, wash your face. So I went whimpering off into the bathroom. I had to stand on a little stool to look into the mirror. And I stood on the stool. I looked at my face. I had black spots all over my face <laughs> from the shoe polish. 
And so here I was looking at my dad with black spots all over my face. He's saying, do you know anything about this? I'm going, no, not me. <laughs> it's like when you tell your parents, I didn't eat any chocolate chips, and there they are all around the sides of your mouth, right? So the Lord knows what your sins are. You can be honest with Him. He already knows everything. Sometimes you might be able to temporarily fool your parents, but God knows. So don't be afraid to tell Him. He's your friend. And you don't get in trouble because you make a mistake. But you don't want to lie to God. Number three, what did Jesus come to do for me? Why did Jesus come? 1 John 4, verse 9 and 10, your answers are on the screen. God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. He wants us to do what? Live. Not just this short life. He wants you to live forever. If we don't have His forgiveness, what is the penalty for sin? And though I want to finish reading this. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and He sent His Son to be the appropriation. That's a big word for the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus came to take our place. He trades places with us because He loves us. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin, the wage is something you earn. What is the wages of sin? Death. Death. Nobody wants to die. And the wages for sin is not just the first death, it's the second death. And that's pretty serious. We're going to talk about that another night. But the gift of God is what? Everlasting. It's eternal life. Jesus is offering you eternal life. And you want to make that decision now. Now, does he have a right to ask us to give our lives to him? No. There's two reasons. One reason is, who made you? Yeah. Jesus. Secondarily, Jesus bought you. He made you, he created you, and he redeemed you with his own life. All right, I need, uh, I have to have a boy tonight. Who has not had a chance yet? A boy, sorry, I don't want to be specific, but I've got a story. You want to come up, Jonathan? Yeah. You, you haven't had a chance yet? I want to look in the chest. Okay. All right, see what you find in there that looks something, it's something red. You can go up, you can open it up. There's a camera in there, wave to the camera. See that camera? Say hi. There we go. Okay, now stand right here and hold that for me. I'm going to tell a story, okay, very carefully. There was a boy named Rodney, and Rodney spent weeks building, he actually spent months, building this very exquisite, model sailboat. And that model sailboat was his pride and joy. And he'd take it out into the river and he had a string on it. And he'd let the string loose and it would sail out and he'd pull it back in. He'd let it out. It would sail. And he loved his sailboat. And he used to baby it and dry it off and put it up on the shelf when he was done sailing it. One day, he took it out in the river and he was sailing it. It was really windy. And the sails were working great and he let a lot of it go out and the string broke. And it came loose from the boat. And his sailboat sailed beautifully down the river and out of sight. And he just cried because he couldn't catch it and the river was too deep. And he went home just broken hearted. About a week later, he was in town and he walked by a store window. And guess what he saw in the store window? His sailboat for $50. And he went and he told the man, he said, that's my sailboat. And the man said, well, I'm sorry, young man. He said, you know, I bought this and, and I spent $20 buying it so that I could sell it. It is a very nice boat, but I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll sell it back to you, but you're going to have to pay me what I paid for it. I paid $20 for it. He said, but I don't have $20. He said, well, I'll hold it for you for a few weeks if you want me to so you can get the money. So Rodney went out and he mowed lawns. And back then you got 50 cents for mowing a lawn. How many lawns would he have to mow to get $20? 40 lawns. That wasn't much back then. Uh, you didn't get much, but $20 was a lot of money. So he worked and worked and a lot of hot days out in the sun mowing grass and he came and he gave the $20 and the man handed him his sailboat and Rodney took his sailboat and he said, oh, I'm so glad to have you back, sailboat. You're mine. You're mine because I made you and you're mine because I bought you. You're mine twice. You know, that's how you belong to Jesus. Isn't that right? Thank you very much, Jonathan. Let's put that over here. So Jesus has redeemed us. That means he created us. 
He owns us. But when the devil kidnapped the world, Jesus bought us back with his own life. So he owns us because he created us, and he owns us because he redeemed us. Number four, question number four. How do I accept Jesus and truly show that I believe in him? What do we do? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you really know what you need to do to be saved? Do you know? You need to accept him with your mind and believe in him. There's several things. The first thing to do, how many of you want to live forever and be on that lifeboat? Those who are watching, you want to live forever and have that eternal life? Let me tell you what to do. First thing you do is you ask him. Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. You've got to begin by saying, Lord, I want eternal life. I want my sins to be forgiven. God will do things for you when you ask. If you don't ask, you won't do. You've got to pray and ask him. The next thing, Acts 16, verse 31, believe. It says here, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You know, you have to have faith. If you trust God, Jesus says, if you have faith, you can move mountains. Wonderful things happen when you have faith. We saw a miracle this week. You know what happened? God moved something bigger than a mountain. We had a hurricane making a beeline for this meeting that was going to take it off the air and cause all kinds of problems. And we had people all over the country praying, and that storm was going straight for Richardson, Texas, and it was turned. And I kept praying and believing that God brought us here to do this meeting, that he was going to answer those prayers. And God bless the faith of all these people. God does wonderful things when you believe. Believe he wants to save you. Sometimes you think, oh, I'm not a very good boy. I'm not a very good girl. I'm not very strong or smart or pretty. God doesn't really care about me. Oh, yes, he does. Don't think like that. That's the devil talking to you. He wants to save you. He loves you desperately because he paid so much. 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. You see, he showed us how much he loves us, and it makes us love him back. He demonstrates his love for us, and his goodness leads us to repentance, which is our next verse, Romans 2, 4. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Who knows what repentance is? All right, what's repentance? When you ask him to forgive your sins. When you ask him to forgive your sins? Well, that's something you do when you're repenting. But repentance is, you know what repentance is? I'll repeat your answer. What does it mean? What? It means to be you're sorry, to, to tell God you're sorry, that you want to change. Let me give you an idea. You ever see a sign that says, no U-turn? God allows U-turns. A uh, U-turn is when a car is going this way and says, oh, going the wrong way, and you turn around and go back the other way, U-turn. God allows U-turns, and that means you turn. You're going towards the devil, and when you're pregnant, you say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way, I'm following the world, I'm doing all the wicked things the world's doing, I want to go to heaven, I, when I went to military school, I learned how to do about face, like this. And that's a U-turn. Now you change directions. Repentance means that you tell God you're sorry. Now, different amounts of offense require different amounts of repentance. I could use a, a girl to help me with this illustration. Who hasn't come up? Young lady right here. Come quickly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What's your name, Grace? Okay. Now, if you're walking out of the uh, church here, go ahead, step on my foot. And you accidentally step on my foot, what would you say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, there you go. And then you'd, I'd say, that's okay, and you could keep on going, right? Right. Right. But if you were running out of the church, and I was carrying my Bible and a bunch of books, and you knocked me down on the ground, <laughs> would you just say you're sorry and keep going? No. Or would you help me back up? You do a little more because you knocked me down. You didn't just step on my foot, right? The more you do to offend somebody, the deeper the repentance. Thank you very much. So if I'm walking out of the church and I step on your toe or I bump you or I hurt you a little bit, I, 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 if I casually touch you, I'd say, I'm sorry. And you say, it's okay. But if I knock you down and break your leg, and I say, excuse me, and I keep going, is that right? No. You don't just say, excuse me, when you break someone's arm or leg. Do you know one time I was riding my bicycle when I was about your age, and a man hit me while I was riding my bicycle, knocked me down in Miami, Florida, 
Miami Beach. And he was in a convertible, I remember, and I looked up and he said, are you all right? I said, yeah. Well, I didn't know what else to say. I was alive. And he took off. He didn't even help me up. He didn't stop or get out of his car. I think he was afraid that I was going to sue him or his insurance was going to go up. I thought, well, that wasn't very nice. Fortunately, it didn't break any bones or anything, but it did hurt my bike. The degree that you offend someone requires that degree of apology. The more you hurt someone, the more you apologize. How much have we hurt the Lord? So the idea of just saying, oops, sorry God. No, real repentance means you get on your knees and next verse, 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will cleanse us, but we must tell him. Do any of you remember every sin you've committed? No, you don't remember every sin you've committed. What I mean by that is uh, you can't remember every detail. I won't ask you to show your hands, but I bet some of you sometimes said something that wasn't true. Or maybe you've taken something that wasn't yours. But you tell the Lord the categories. You say, Lord, I have not been honest. That's one of the commandments. Please forgive me for dishonesty or lying. Please forgive me for being disrespectful to my parents. Confess your sins to God, and what will God do? He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. And then it says that he receives you and we receive him. John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God. He gives us power to be his children. And he gives you new life, new heart. Question number five, will my life change when I give it to Jesus and join his family? And what does Jesus do to help me? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. Isn't it amazing how that caterpillar you see there on your screen can turn into that butterfly? What a metamorphosis. What a transformation. God will do that for you. Where you're crawling around, eating leaves, you'll be flying, drinking nectar. If God can do that with a bug, he can do it for you. It's a, you become a new creature. Jesus says, you show your love to him by being willing to follow him. If you love me, keep my commandments. He's given you a new heart because he loves you, you love him back. And then you have a new birth. The Bible says you must be born again. You know, something amazing happened just, a, I think it was a couple weeks ago. There was a little baby named Macy Hope McCartney. Parents were Chad and Carrie McCartney. And this little girl was born twice. She was born again. You know, and we're not talking about religion. The doctors, when mommy was six months pregnant, found out that the baby had a dangerous tumor growing on her back. And if they didn't operate, she wasn't going to live. So six months into the pregnancy, they took the baby out of mommy's tummy far enough where they could do the little surgery and take the tumor off and put her back in. Two months later, she was born again and everything was fine. So I don't know what her birthday is because she was born twice. You need to be born twice. How many here were born once so far? Let me see. At least once. Everyone born once? Just checking to see if you're paying attention. Everybody's been born that time, right? But you need to be born again. That's the new birth by giving your heart to Jesus. He gives you a new mind, a new life. You know, it tells us in Jeremiah 1.15, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God has known us through all eternity. He has a plan for you. A thousand years ago, God knew about you, and he has a great plan for your life, but he won't force you. You must choose. What will happen when you choose the Lord? John chapter 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy might be full. You want joy? That's happiness. And again, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18. Let's all say Habakkuk. Habakkuk, that's a hard book to say. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Christians should be happy. And again, Psalms 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is in my heart. God puts his law in our hearts, and it's a delight to serve him. Jesus came to give us an abundant life. He wants us to have a full life, an abundant life. That's why it's so important that now, while you're young, you give your life to Jesus. All right, and I need uh, two volunteers. 
I wonder if, well, I'll tell you what, let's have some of our visiting choir, because they may not be, be back. You can come, okay? Um, you can come up. I don't know your names. You don't have tags on. Come on up. Look in the mystery chest there and see if you see something that you can maybe set on fire. Look in the chest. Go ahead. One, you got it there? All right. There should be two in there. Okay, you can close the chest. Let me help you. There you go. Good job. Set them, let's set them here on top. And uh, all right, how many candles we got here? Can everyone see? Got two candles here. Do you know how to use one of these? You press this thing down and you pull the trigger. You want to try and light that? Press, you got to press that button on top and then pull the trigger. Hold the button in. It's probably not a good thing to have, teach kids to play with matches in church, huh? There, let me help you with that. And for the illustration's purpose, that's all right. There we go. All right. That was hard. No wonder you're having a challenge here. All right, that's one. That's two. Okay. Two candles. Are these candles the same? Well, they're the same color, same stand, same wax. What's the one difference? One's tall, one's short. Which candle is going to burn the longest? Which one's going to burn the longest? Tall one. Of course, the tallest one, the same wax. Gonna, which one's going to give the most light? The taller one will burn longer. It will give more light. Isn't that right? Here's the point. What's worth more, 10 plus 70 or 70 plus 10? Oh, I know it sounds like 10 plus 70 is the same as 70 plus 10 mathematically, but with your life, what's better? Give your heart to Jesus when you're 70 and serve him for 10 years, or give your heart to Jesus when you're 10 and serve him for 70 years? How much, isn't it worth more to give your heart to Jesus when you're 10 and serve him for 70 years? It's good for everybody to give their heart to Jesus, but what's the best time to give your heart to Jesus so you can get the most light out into the world? It's when you've got your life before you. All right, you girls, you want to blow out a candle? There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, let's give them a hand. A father was sailing through the warm Caribbean waters with his two teenage boys. And the father knew that they were going through some shark-infested waters, so he told his boys, do not play near the edge of the boat for the next few days because we don't want you falling in. There's a lot of sharks in these waters, and these sharks, they do attack people. Well, the boys weren't listening because they'd never seen any sharks for weeks. And they were running around the ship chasing each other. And one of them began to slip and he grabbed his brother's t-shirt and the two of them fell off into the warm water. Well, the father heard the splash. The boys were good swimmers. And as the sailboat started to sail away from where the boys fell in, they were calling, they're shouting. The father came up from below the deck of the sailboat and he saw his boys. and and he lowered the sail down so the boat would stop floating away and, and uh, told the boys, come on back to the boat. Well, they were out there dunking each other and arguing and fighting and, as teenage boys do. And the father then looked and the water was very clear. And guess what he saw circling? He said, boys, those aren't dolphins. I see sharks. He said, swim quickly back to the boat. Do it calmly so you don't stir up the water and swim back to the boat. And the boys thought, oh, we've got lots of time. Dad's just trying to scare us. There's no sharks. We haven't seen sharks. He's trying to teach us a lesson. So that they said, let's show them we're not afraid. And they began to dunk each other and to play. And, and the father said, hurry back to the boat. He saw the sharks were closing their circle. A shark can smell one drop of blood in hundreds and thousands of gallons of water. And the father knew that if something didn't happen, those sharks were going to go in and take the first bite and they'd smell blood and go into a frenzy and his boys would be killed. And so in a desperate effort to save his boys, the father went below deck, he got a knife. He cut his wrists, he dove in the water, and he swam away from the boat in a different direction. And then the boys saw the water begin to turn and turn red. Now here's the question. If those children stay in the water, is there any more their father can do for them after he's given his life? 
if we decide to stay in the world or to stay in, in sin after God has come to save us, what more can he do than giving his life? There is only one lifeboat. You know what the lifeboat is? Jesus. You remember there was a storm on the sea? And Jesus calmed the storm. The disciples survived the storm because they were in the boat with Jesus. Nothing in the world could sink that boat. That boat was unsinkable. The only unsinkable ship is the boat with Jesus in it. Don't you want to get on that lifeboat? I'd like to invite you to take your cards. I think we've got some cards here in our groups. Now, we did this a couple of nights ago, but we know we have some new children every night. And tonight we're talking about salvation. I want to ask you again, if you'd like to make a decision to accept Jesus as your Savior, please take the cards that we're passing out. And there's some simple questions here. Write your name and your address on it. Some of you, if you'd like to make a decision for Jesus and you're maybe at home, you can contact us at Amazing Facts Kids. And we'll tr try and put you in touch with a Bible teaching, preaching church. If you make a decision tonight for the Lord, kids, make sure and talk to your parents about this. Talk to your pastor, your youth pastor, your group leader. But I want to have prayer with you, again, that you will know that you've got Jesus in your heart. There's three questions on the card. Simple questions. Yes, I want to give my heart to Jesus and follow the teachings in the Bible. The second question, check yes there. I'd like to be baptized and have all of my sins washed away. Check that box. If you're interested in baptism, make sure and talk to your parents too about that and your pastor, and they can help you plan for that. And the angels will sing. Question three, you'd like to meet with a pastor and talk to them about baptism. Please write your name on your card. This is a way you can begin the first step of getting in that lifeboat and knowing that you've got eternal life. And again, I want to encourage all of our friends who are watching. If you would like to make this decision, hopefully your groups have the decision cards, or you can just go to amazingfactskids.org. Let us know. We'll try and contact you and encourage you in your decision. Now, we're going to need that prayer. And then here at our local group, you can finish filling out your cards after we have prayer. So let's just stop our pencils for just a second. And let's all pray together with our friends who are watching on TV, okay? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. For you're loving us so much that you gave your son. You gave your life that we might be saved. We know the only lifeboat that's going to survive the storm is the one with Jesus in it. We want to be in that boat, Lord. We're accepting him. We're asking him. We're believing. We're sorry for our sins. And we want that new life. Thank you, Lord. We're praying in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Don't forget, tomorrow night's lesson, we'll be meeting again. It's called A Day with the King. We look forward to seeing each of you then. Bring your friends. Do you have anything that you're afraid of? While Paul wanted to make it clear in his letter to the Hebrews that Jesus was there as their savior and friend, he also wanted them to know Christ's position at the very right hand of God. This is why when Paul opened his message, 
he presented Jesus as the one who sits at the right hand of the Father and as our high priest. Yet Paul also wanted to make it clear that this same Jesus, who is the one who stands by the right hand of God, stands by us, and he will represent us in the judgment as our advocate. This is powerful. Don't miss it. Here's the reason why. We have nothing to fear in the judgment because as our high priest, Jesus is not just our advocate, but he's also our judge. Make no mistake, sin is destructive and dangerous. We need to pray to God daily and ask him to create within us a clean heart and to renew a right spirit within us, like David prayed in Psalm 51 verse 10. But how wonderful the assurance and how great the peace that comes to us as we realize that when we come to Jesus and as we surrender our all to him, our case is in the hands of a lawyer who has never lost a case and never will. Truly, this is why in Daniel 7 verse 22, the Bible says that a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. This world can't go on forever as it is. Jesus is coming soon. The very fabric of the earth is tearing itself apart because of sin and because of the betrayal of humanity's stewardship over God's creation. We're destroying the earth. Jesus has promised that he will be with us always and that he would prepare a home in heaven for us. Jesus, the creator of all things, has promised that one day he will recreate this earth, Earth 2.0 and it will be Eden restored and even better. Eternity will not be long enough to praise him for all that he has done for us. We will never be able to thank God enough. And in the words of a wonderful hymn, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my love, my all. Sandra, happy Sabbath and welcome to Hope Sabbath School. I believe that we give uh, thanks, praises and uh, honor God with his love and his uh, unfailing mercies that has been with us throughout till date. Guys, it's the 12th Sabbath of 2022 and uh, unfortunately it's the second last Sabbath of this first quarter of 2022. And yes, as we reflect on the lessons that we've learned and what all that we've shared uh, with uh, each of our church members, uh, or to those of you who, who joins us from the comfort of your own homes, I believe that we've been blessed with messages and also discussions that we do share for the past 11 Sabbaths. And uh, yes, again, we continue to praise God and His uh, love and His caring arms that has been with us throughout. Extending the world's master's welcome to all of our friends and families and to those of you who are tuning in and are joining us today. Bolvinaka. Happy Sabbath, and uh, we welcome you this morning. Now, first, we do acknowledge the presence of the Godhead, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and unseen angels of heaven and the heavenly hosts who are amongst us as we speak. Now, for, as it is written, for two or three are gathered uh, under my name, I am in their midst. We welcome them today, and we welcome them in good health. Also extending, uh, Master's welcome to all of you who are joining us today. Uh, here at the Central Eastern, to our friends who are tuning in from the north and also from the west, to the outer islands throughout the Pacific, and if you're tuning in from somewhere across the, the world, Bolivinaka, happy Sabbath to you, and thank you for joining us today. And now we'd also like to welcome our panelists uh, this morning, today, Taltala Mini, and uh, also Maria. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, it is uh, my prayer and our prayer that whatever we're going to be discussing discussing today is going to be a means of blessings in each of our lives and also help us 
uh, strengthen each other's bonds as we prepare ourselves for the kingdom and the soon return of our Savior. Um, at this point, Maria, if you can just uh, open our discussion with a word of prayer. Okay, let us pray. Dear God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence, Lord. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you are our Redeemer, that you are our Savior, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the life of the viewers, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the life of for their lives, Lord, and for their families, Lord. Uh, and Lord, today, Lord, as we're about to share your word, we pray that you will bestow upon us the Holy Spirit, that you will speak to us and that uh, you will enable us to not only share these words, but to live by them, Lord. Lord, we feel that we are sinners when we fall short of our, uh, your glory, Lord. Please forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' mighty and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Bible text is uh, from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses Verse 28, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Mm -hmm. You know, friends, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29, the passage for this week is the climax of the letter, and it sums up the main concern by repeating the idea of which it started. You know, God has spoken to us in the person of His Son. And we need to be to pay careful attention to Him in these last days. The description of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24, this um, uh, epitomizes the latest assertions about Him. You know, friends, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And His blood provides for believers His priestly and royal ministry in our behalf is a cause for celebration for the heavenly hosts. And also, uh, finally, that we can draw from these lessons that in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29, it contains the last and climatic exhortation about God's judgment is coming. And it will bring destruction to his enemies, but vindication and a kingdom to his people. Mm -hmm. You can find the text in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Now, the ending reaffirms the importance that of Jesus' achievement at the cross. And it directs, it directs believers to the consummation of Jesus. You know, friends, victory, Jesus' victory at the second, on his second coming. And Paul used imagery from Daniel chapter 7 to remind the readers that Jesus has received a kingdom from God, the judge, you can find in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to 14, and is going to share his kingdom with believers the saints of the Most High, who will possess it forever and ever. And as we continue to discuss, we're going to be learning more from our Sabbath School discussion today. To open our discussions, tal tal meaning. Coming to Mount Zion. Mm. Why is coming to Mount Zion better than coming to Mount Sinai? Amen. Thank you, um, uh, Brother Etika. Thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction to the lesson. Now, I want to take us to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 20 through to verse 22. May I just uh, read that to us before we uh, look into that question. Now, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 20 through to verse 22, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Now you find here the contrast between Mount Zion and Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai mm -hmm. was the experience of the Israelites of old, when they were told to come to the foot of the mountain and the presence of God was there in person and how terrible and terrifying the experience was. Even Moses was frightened according to the verse that we have read. Now, the difference is that, is, is that Mount Zion, the picture of Mount Zion is used to symbolize the, 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 the picture of uh, the presence of God in a sense that the term Mount um, Mount Sinai, rather, is used 
to, to symbolize the presence and uh, the throne of God where God dwells. And now it's the mention of Mount Zion. But then Mount Zion is uh, the very presence of God where Jesus has gone forth to. Okay? Now it is says here in verse 22 that we can come into, uh, you have come into Mount Zion. Now, we are not there in person, but we are there in faith mm. because someone has represented us there. Okay, And so when Christ is there in Mount Zion, okay, in the presence of God, in the dwelling of God, we are there as well because he is there for us. Mm. And so we can say that coming to Mount Zion is more... Um, um, you know, it's much better in a sense that Mount Sinai is there, is, is people are there in person and they experience the, the terrible sin of the presence of God. But Mount Zion is much better because there is someone who's representing us there. And we are there in faith because our representative is there for us. Okay? Mm. Amen. Thank you for... The thought, uh, Dr. Almini, and just continue mm. to continue from your discussions uh, about why is the invitation to come to Mount Zion such good news? Mm. Uh, as I've said, that coming to Mount Zion, it's coming to the dwelling and into the presence of God. It's it's such a good news, in a sense that we are not there in person. Mm. Okay, we are not there to represent ourselves. There is someone who is there for us. Mm. Now, it, it will be easy to understand this when we when we look at the the the, uh, the process of how the 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 Old Testament sanctuary is played out and how the priest represents the people in the most holy place. Now, the sinners themselves are not there, mm. but there is someone else who's there on their behalf, and it's the same with us today. We are not there in the presence of God, but then Jesus, who is our representative, our high priest, is there on our behalf. And so that's why it is such an inviting thing to come to Mount Zion. It's, it's Zion, uh, rather. It's such a good news because it is acceptable. Mm -hmm. okay? God accepts his son that he presents himself there on our behalf. Tala has just shared so beautifully about uh, you know the what glory and what an honor it is to come mm. to Mount Zion, uh, and um, you know there have been numerous times over the years, uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, coming to Mount Zion and willingly you know like um, approaching the presence, mm. pre the presence of God, and I'm someone who was probably baptized really young, like mm. the age of fourteen. And um, I'm going to be honest, I didn't, I, was, I didn't really understand. I mean, I knew I wanted to follow Jesus, but I was someone who got, you know, baptized really young and I didn't really understand it. But then, um, you know, as an adult coming into my teenage years and then finally when I, uh, you know, come into my 20s and on, I, I began to realize what it truly means mm -hmm. to, to experience Christ. And it was no longer going to church on s Sabbath because, you know, because that's what my I saw my parents mm -hmm. doing. But it was more of uh, going to church because I loved Christ. Mm -hmm. And that I only accomplished that when I only began to understand that when I truly came into the presence of God to experience Him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the beauty of the God that we serve. When we come there in faith, there is someone there to represent us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, even in our sinfulness, even he is faithful. If we confess it, he will be there mm -hmm. to aid us and to guide us through. And I believe, you know, there have been many experiences as young people. I think the viewers at home, young mm -hmm. people, they can relate. Sometimes we falter and fall. And, and sometimes when we feel unworthy, I know I'm someone who's uh, probably gone through experiences and I don't want to take up too much of time. But mm -hmm. yeah, you know, when you feel unworthy and you feel like you've done something wrong mm -hmm. and you don't think that people will understand, sometimes when I, in those moments when we bow our heads and we pray, we can actually feel the presence of God True. and how, how heartwarming and, you know, it is to have someone there to represent us in Mount Zion mm -hmm. and ultimately to the presence of God. What mm -hmm. a great blessing. Indeed. Uh, to those of you who are joining in from home, I believe that uh, you're enjoying our discussions uh, today. And uh, thank you both for the thought that you both have uh, shared with us today. And then continuing from, uh, as we've uh, touched about coming to Mount Zion, coming to God, the judge of all. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Maria, in a, how, many people are afraid of the judgment. Oh. Why is coming to God, the judge of all, is also good news? Okay, I think, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like, you said that many people are afraid of judgment. Mm. I agree with that. As a child, I never understood it. Mm. I mean, I heard my parents tell me that judgment is a good thing. But to me, it seemed scary because I knew, I, I you know, they told me to listen. I didn't listen. Mm. I was disobedient. I did this. And I was like, no. If I went to God and he would judge me because I was familiar of the worldly way of judgment. Mm. Not necessarily. I, I didn't really perceive the heavenly way of judgment and the nature of the God that we serve. But we'll tend to the Bible, of course. Mm. We'll tend to the Bible for our answers. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 23, and the word of God says, To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the uh, spirits of just men made perfect. Now, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse uh, 23. And uh, here it sort of alludes to uh, the judgment. Uh, the writer in Hebrews is sort of alluding to uh, the judgment that will happen at the, in the, mm. you know, uh, back then, you know, the judgment wasn't happening then. So he's sort of alluding to the future, predicting the judgment that will happen. And we find other verses in the Bible. If we go to the book of Daniel, mm. and um, Daniel, he's um, one of those books that you, you know, you uh, I think if you could just uh, read it out for us, uh, Daniel chapter uh, 7. Daniel chapter 7, uh, chapter verses, seven nine verses 9 to 10. To 10 yes. okay, I'm reading from the New Living mm. Translation, and it reads, I watched as thrones were put in place, mm. and the Ancient One sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. Verse 10, and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his mm. presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session and the books were opened. Amen. So we see, you see these two verses, they sort of have the same parallel. Mm. Like you, there is a judgment scene. And of course, there is the Ancient of day, Days, God himself. And then you have the Son of Man, as it mentions there. And it mm. also mentions it in the book of Hebrews, coming in and the books are open. So of course, there is a judgment. Mm. And many times we fear it. Now, why should we not be afraid of the judgment, Etika? Let the Bible answer that for us as well. The book of John, John chapter 5, 22 to 24. And, it's, and the word of God says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. To our viewers at home, I'll repeat that. For the Father judgeth no man, uh, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honored the Father. He that honored not the Son, honored not the Father which hath sent him. Why is it such a good news? Because Vetika, mm. it is a judgment that it is in your favor. Mm. You are already winning. Think about it. The king of heaven and earth who came to die for you and me, on the judgment day, he is your redemption. He has been the lamb that is slain for your sins and he will stand there and then he will tell the father because Vetika has, you know, in faith has repented. I have forgiven him of your sins. Mm. You must cleanse him and you must accept him into your throne of grace. And that's the beauty of the judgment. Mm. It's a winning uh, race, you know. It, it offers vindication for the righteousness. Mm. And that to me is, I think when we truly understand the nature of God, we will see the judgment as a epitome or the reflection or manifestation of love. Mm. A God who offers you the redemption, and then he doesn't condemn you. He will be the one there to say, I have died for your sins. Mm -hmm. And that is the beauty uh, of the judgment. So, uh, yeah, Etika, to answer your question, that is why I think that the judgment is good news. That, thank you for that. That was a, a nice thought. And I believe that most of us have been blessed by those words of uh, encouragement. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, to, to most of our families who fear about judgment, fear about judgment. if they now have a clear understanding mm -hmm. on uh, why, not you know, why not to fear judgment. Why not to fear judgment. Yeah, I think, I think, I believe that uh, if in order for us not to fear judgment, we have to understand the nature of the God that we serve. Many. We need to read the Bible and we need to understand that He is a loving God and mm. He desires that no one should perish. Amen. And you know, the Bible says it's the same, so He will not change that. Amen. And uh, I believe, Tala, that we've been blessed by those words. Mm. And uh, just uh, continuing from what uh, Maria has shared, when did you begin to realize that we do not need to be afraid of the final judgment if Jesus is our judge? If, if I'm asked that uh, personally, if I have to answer from my, from my experience, the, um, the time that I begin to, when the, the, the time that I, I really do not have that fear about judgment was when I come to really understand 
how the sanctuary system works. Mm. Okay? Because when you look at the sanctuary systems, you find that the priest is the one that represents the sinners. Mm. And it's the high priest that stands in the presence of God. Mm. You ask the question, where is the sinner? The sinner is outside of the, 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 the sanctuary. Mm. He, he is outside. He's not there to, to be present. It's the, it's the high priest that is standing on his behalf. Mm. And so when you, when you look at that and you, and you look at the plan of salvation mm. through Jesus Christ, in, in John chapter 3, verse 16, is a verse that is mostly quoted, but then many times we quote it unconsciously, meaning that we, we say it, but we are not thinking about what it means. Okay? For God so loved the world. Okay, this is, who is that God referring to? Obviously referring to the Father. Mm -hmm. That He gave His who? His only son. begotten Son. Okay, so... God was more than willing to give his son, but then the son was more than willing to come and die for us. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It's the same one that was more than willing to come and die for us. It's the very one that is sitting as the judgment in, in, on, on the judgment seat. We read that, of course, in John chapter 5, verses 22 to 24. Mm -hmm. And Jesus himself says, the father is not going to judge anything. I am the one who's going to judge everything. And so we see there, the very one that was willing to die for us mm -hmm. is the one that is going to, that is standing there representing us and, and as well the one that is sitting on the judgment. Mm -hmm. And for me, it, it affirms what Daniel said in, in chapter 7, verse 22. Mm -hmm. You will find there, and the time came, this is towards the very last part of the verse, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom, um, I'm sorry, um, until the ancient of days came and the judgment was made in favor mm. of the saints. So the judgment is in favor for us. Mm. So that, that's, that's to answer the question, uh, uh, um, Brother Etika. We do not need to be afraid of the mm. judgment because Jesus is there. And why we should not be afraid? Mm. Yeah, because the very one that came to rescue us is sitting there on the judgment seat. Yeah, mm. true. I think you will tell her for that thought. And uh, just to take us back on mm. uh, John 3.16, eh? mm. that he gave his only son, his mm. only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have an everlasting life. You know, Tala, if even if a parent who has two children, mm. two kids. It's going to be hard for him or hard for them to even give one. But this God is such a loving God that he gave his only begotten son. Mm, the, only one. the only one that he has mm. to actually... Uh, and he, the child is willingly to, willing to die for our sins and is to be there as well to be our judge. And you know, we, it's amazing to see how the connection and the bond that these two have, mm. the love for the love of mankind, so that we can have eternal life. Thank you for the thoughts that you both shared. And just continuing from the thought that you've shared, Daltala, what counsel would you give a friend who says to you, I love Jesus, but I'm afraid of judgment? You see, that, that phrase is, is contradicting already. Mm. It's just contradicting itself. <laughs> you cannot say that you love Jesus and then you say that you are afraid of the judgment. Um, you are like, it's just like you... Yeah, uh, it, it's basically one sentence is defeated by the other, okay? Um, so when you love Jesus, you're saying that you're accepting Him as your Savior. But one thing you need to understand as well, that you are also accepting Him totally. Mm -hmm. He is not just your Savior, but your representative and the judge as well. Mm -hmm. And that is something that should encourage us and gives us the confidence to come into the presence of God and, and to, 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 to look forward to the judgment. Judgment is the time when, when 
the believers of God will finally be vindicated mm. from all the sufferings that are here, happening here in, in this world. You know, the falsely accused of the believers, mm. um, the persecution that the believers are going through because the dominancy of the world's right towards everything. And the world is sort of defeating the truthfulness and the truth that the believers are trying to stand on from the scripture. Mm -hmm. And the only way and the only time that we will be freed and vindicated from all this is when the judgment sits. Okay? Judgment and yeah, yeah the, the judgment is our victory. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because that is when the time that the God is going to pronounce um, freedom and victory mm -hmm. upon himself and his followers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. True. Amen. Amen for those thoughts, uh, mm. Tal Tal. And um, as we've done with uh, coming to God, the judge of all, we're continuing our studies on surviving the shaking of the heavens and the earth. And I believe to those of you tuning in from home, I believe that you're also following us through your Bibles and uh, I'm glad that you're part of our discussions today. Maria, when did the voice of God shake the earth? When did the voice of God shake the earth? You know, uh, it's one of the things that we find a common occurrence in the Old Testament. I'll just read the reference from Hebrews, from which uh, that verse comes. And it's Hebrews, to our viewers at home, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 26, 25 to 26. And the word of God says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escapeth, escape not, who refuse him that speak to the earth, much more shall we not escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Mm -hmm. So here we find that, you know, the earth has been, and then, of course, the voice of God is also shaking heaven. But uh, as you mentioned, the shaking of the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the Bible, often uh, there is... Um, uh, you know, uh, the shaking of the earth, an earthquake that follows the deliverance of God. Mm -hmm. It sort of prompts the deliverance of God. You know, you read stories like the story of um, Deborah and Barak, mm -hmm. you know, Tisara, and when, when God offered them that victory, mm -hmm. there was, of course, shaking of the earth. And uh, Tala mentioned an important point earlier that, you know, the judgment is victory. Mm -hmm. The judgment, uh, therefore, is God's deliverance from his people, from the adversary, the devil, mm -hmm. who, you know, condemns them, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, tempts them. And uh, let's go to another verse real quick, the book of Exodus. Now let's just, uh, we'll just jump into the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verse 18 to um, 19. And uh, the word of God says, um, And then the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed around louder. Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came from Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. Now, uh, and then, of course, there's another verse that I'd like us to read from the book of Psalms. And then, of course, we'll just, uh, I'll just share a bit on it and how it hints out to the judgment. Mm -hmm. Psalms chapter 68. To our viewers at home, Psalms chapter 68, uh, verse uh, 7 through till 8. And the word of God says, O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, and when thou didst march through the wilderness... The earth shook and the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God and the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. Deliverance is often associated with the shaking of the earth because the presence of God comes down to his people. And uh, therefore, I believe that uh, the shaking of the earth is when the judge occurs, when the judgment occurs. Mm -hmm. Because as we've mentioned before, the mm -hmm. judgment is the victory of the believers. It is the presence of God coming down to man, reconciling us back to him. And, uh, you know, once and for all, vindicating the righteous mm -hmm. and offering defeat to the adversary, the devil. Amen. So that is when... The voice of God shakes the, mm, earth. shakes the earth. When will the voice of God shake the heavens? Interesting. We've read as well that the voice of God shakes the heavens, mm -hmm. not only the earth and the heavens. So, um, you know, the, what, what's the difference between the two? Okay, we'll go back to the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll just go back to the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, we've read this verse before. I just want us to read it more again. And this word yet once again signified the removing of things that are shaken mm -hmm. as of things that are made and those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Okay, mm -hmm. so what event is it? And 28, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, mm -hmm. let us by grace whereby we may serve God accept, acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. Mm -hmm. So we find that there is a removing of things through the shaking of the heavens, mm -hmm. removing of things and... Um, 
We'll go to another verse before I link the two. Uh, the book of Haggai, uh, to the viewers at home, Haggai, that's one of the small prophets right after the book of uh, Zephaniah, I believe. Uh, Haggai chapter 2, verses uh, 6 to 9, the word of God says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth mm -hmm. and the sea and the dry land. I will shake nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with the glory, says the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. The shaking of the heaven, I believe, is the second coming. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we find here that uh, in the book of Hebrews, it mentions that it, there is an established of an everlasting kingdom. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, corresponding with the shaking of the heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, here as well, it talks about how, you know, God will finally fill this house with glory mm -hmm. and the Lord of hosts. Uh, and that will happen when Jesus will return uh, on that uh, bright and cloudless morning. I think. So mm -hmm. the shaking of the, the heavens, I believe, is uh, when the second coming will occur. Mm -hmm. Amen. And uh, yes, I believe that we're all going to be looking forward to the day when Amen. the earth and the heaven shakes. Certainly. And um, tell, tell, what are the prophecies in the scripture assures us of God's ultimate triumph over all forces that seek to overthrow his kingdom and oppress his people? Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Etika. We look at um, two verses uh, that are there in the scripture. Uh, they are there in the Old Testament and then we'll come to the New Testament. It's in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 mm. verse 44. And uh, let me read from the New King James Version. And here is how it reads. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, we understand, we, we know mm. the the... The Daniel chapter 2, it's the dream of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and mm. after uh, the statue with different kind of stones mm. that uh, had been presented. And then after that, there was another stone that came. It represents the kingdom of mm. God. Okay, mm. And uh, let's have a look at an another one that is in Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. And here is how it reads. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Mm. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So these are the prophecies mm. that points forward to the second coming is when the time that we will, um, that God's people will possess and will overthrow this kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God will be there forever. Mm -hmm. And there's another verse that I wish to uh, go to in New Testament, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 19 to 21. Revelation 19, verse 19 to 21, and here is how it reads. And I saw the beast, the mm -hmm. kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of the fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Mm -hmm. Now we understand Revelation 13 and how the two beasts, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth get to torment the world. Mm -hmm. eh? And we see here that in the second coming, okay, the prophecy says that when Christ comes, he's going to set up his kingdom and all this, the torment that is coming from the world will cease mm -hmm. through the power of God's word. That is to come from our Lord when he comes in the second coming. Okay, That's the prophecy um, Brother Etika. Amen. Thank you, Tal Tal. And uh, I believe that uh, concludes the surviving and the shaking of heavens and the earth. And, uh, you know, again, we have to expect that one day we will definitely experience the shakings of the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. Inheriting an unshakable kingdom. Tal Tal, what things that cannot be shaken will remain in God's unshakable kingdom? Amen. Let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27. 
Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Mm -hmm. And so here we find that if there is anything that cannot be shaken is the what? Mm -hmm. It's the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Every other kingdom, according to uh, Daniel chapter 2, when you look at those kingdoms symbolized by the stones that made up the image, they were all shaken and in fact shattered by the stone that came from heaven. Mm -hmm. And the only heaven, the only kingdom that will not be shaken is God's kingdom. It's a kingdom that is established by God himself. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Taltal. And uh, Maria, why is it good news that the king of the unshakable kingdom is a consuming fire? Why is it a good news that the king of the unshakable kingdom is a consuming fire? Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 29. So I know the viewers must be thinking, where does it say that he is a consuming fire? Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Uh, uh, journey with me to the book of Hebrews. The word of God says, for our God is the consuming fire. This is right before 28, mm -hmm. where he says, where we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Mm -hmm. The unshakable kingdom. He is the king of the unshakable kingdom and he is the uh, consuming fire. Mm -hmm. And I think when we think about it, I think we have to understand the symbolism that the mm -hmm. book of Hebrew has mm -hmm. with the ordeals of the sanctuary yeah. and what the consuming fire ha uh, means or represents mm -hmm. in, in terms of the sanctuary and the dealings of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. We find that uh, the sanctuary is where, you know, uh, sacrifices are being burnt, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in exchange for um, where, you know, they confess their sins and mm -hmm. sacrifices are offered and it's consumed by fire. Mm -hmm. I believe, uh, and we've talked about how, uh, you know, the shaking of the heaven and the earth, ultimately it means the defeat of the enemy and everything. And uh, the good thing about the king of the, of the unshakable kingdom being a consuming fire mm. is that it means that our redemption is confirmed. Mm. It is certain mm. because when our sins are forgiven, he is a consuming fire. He has mm. consumed all of it. And when, of course, uh, when the heavens will shake and when Jesus will return, our enemies, of course, will be consumed mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, the devil, the old serpent of old. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is why it is good news because mm -hmm. uh, he is a consuming fire, but he is on your side. Mm -hmm. He is doing things for the greater good of mm -hmm. those who love him. The, you mm -hmm. know, there's a verse in the Bible that says that. So that is why it's because it um, represents certainty mm -hmm. that our sins are in terms of the sanctuary, that our sins are consumed mm -hmm. and they are no longer remembered. Mm -hmm. Amen. And uh, just on top of that, mm. Maria, mm. We, we live in a world that is filled with this disruption and uncertainty. Certainly. And what are your thoughts about receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken? I think uh, it's hope. Mm. Honestly, mm. it's assurance and it is unshaken. You know, I, if I shake my leg, if I you know, tap my feet a bit here, you can feel the table shake. Mm. But something that is not shaken, something that cannot be moved, mm. it is permanent, it is true. Mm. That for me is hope, Ithika, because it offers me hope that, um, you know, there's no change in it, mm. that it is certainly something that God has promised for me and I can receive it in faith mm. uh, when I choose to follow him. So, you know, living in a world of uncertainty, you don't know what tomorrow holds. But what I do know is that my Savior is faithful and that yeah. he is constantly interceding for me. Mm. And that for me is hope. And it provides a certainty and uh, amidst the, you know, the unpredictability of this world. We don't know. Probably tomorrow we'll start having lockdowns and whatnot. <laughs> but one thing that we can remain firm in is that the God that we serve establish, is establishing an unshakable kingdom Amen. for you and me. Mm. And let's be a lesson to those of us who are tuning mm. in from home is we are preparing ourselves to inherit an unshakable kingdom. Let mm. our faith be unshakable also. Amen. You know, in this times of trials and temptations will definitely go through a lot of things but I believe we are looking forward to that day to be part of that permanent kingdom mm -hmm. that unshakable kingdom that we're all working towards too. Thank you very much Maria for the wonderful thought and thank you Taltalmini from what you've shared uh, before and uh, now responding to the God's goodness mm -hmm. and grace. Taltala what are some appropriate responses to God's mercy and grace. Now, let's have a look at what is given there in Hebrews chapter 12, mm -hmm. verse 28. We've referred to this verse a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And again, you will find in that verse, if you observe that verse carefully, 
it, there is an invitation for us to do something there in that verse. It mm. says there, let us have grace mm. by which we may serve God acceptably mm. with reverence and godly fear. And so that is something that we need to have in us, that we need to have God's grace so that this grace will move in us to serve God with reverence mm. and godly fear. And there's another verse that I want to go to, still in Hebrews, but go to uh, chapter 13, verses 15 through to verse 16. It says, therefore, by him, by Jesus, okay, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, okay, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name in verse 16. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Well, well, we have God's grace in our hearts. How do we so forth and appreciate God's grace and love in our hearts? We continue to offer the sacrifice of praise, giving thanks to God and as well, continue to do good things to others. So uh, sharing with others, give to someone who is in need, show love to someone who is physically or spiritually down, visit the sick, visit those that are lonely, encourage those that are downhearted, um, uh, share with someone or listen to someone who wishes to share his or her burdens uh, of heart to whoever, okay? Just be there for someone in the grace of God. Amen. That is something that is needed to be shown um, in, this, in, in our world today. And that is the appropriate response to God's mercy mm -hmm. towards us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Taltala, for that thought. And just uh, from what you've shared, what inspired counsel does the Apostle Paul uh, give to Christian in Rome and also to us as recipients of God's mercy and grace. Yes, let's have a look at uh, Rome, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so the inspired counsel that is given here by Paul is so very relevant, applicable to, to our world today. The world today is filled with um, amusements, mm -hmm. many things that really attracts the desire of self, mm -hmm. and it uplifts only something that really are just focusing on us. But God here is saying, your body be a living sacrifice. In mm -hmm. everything that you do, it has to honor God rather than self. Because the movement of the world today is just focusing on self. So and so the counsel here is given by Paul to focus on God. Okay? It's mm -hmm. more like Hebrews chapter 12. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. And everything that you do is for the honor of God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that thought to um, Taltala. Uh, Maria, mm. share an example from the scripture of someone who responded to the goodness of the grace of God. Oh, we can be here all day. There's so many examples. Uh, you know, I think uh, before I share an example, I'd like to say something. Uh, uh, when we read the Bible, we find, and even if you, when we exercise our faith, we find that when we experience the goodness of God, the interesting thing about it is that you just can't keep it in. Mm. 
you, ultimately, it just comes unconsciously. You want to share it. You want others around you to experience it. And Tala has quoted uh, Paul. And uh, we see that in the life of Paul. Uh, you know, Paul, he was Saul and he was persecuting the believers. But when he met Jesus and, uh, you know, he came to knew his Savior, he not only spread the world to the, to the Jews, he went out to the Gentiles. Mm. And that is an, someone who has experienced the goodness of God, experienced redemption. He did not deserve to be re, uh, redeemed, you know. He was one of the people that were there when Stephen was stoned. Mm. I always think, you know, it'd be interesting when you go to heaven and you see Paul and Stephen meet. What would it be like? But uh, I'm straying from the point here. The idea is when we, you know, Paul was from that, mm -hmm. having been redeemed, having been accepted into the kingdom of God, to the unshakable kingdom, he shared it. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is the interesting thing about uh, experiencing God's goodness. Yes. Amen. And I believe that's also has to be a challenge for us in these mm -hmm. last days to True. share about True. the unshakable kingdom the unshakable of kingdom. Uh, God. And uh, let's, uh, let's not, let's continue to share about it, mm -hmm. but less to those who know about it and more to those who are not aware mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. this. Yes, exactly. Like what Paul did, he mm -hmm. didn't just share to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. It's and easy to go where you're comfortable. Mm, true. And uh, so we can familiarize ourselves with people mm -hmm. and also uh, surround ourselves and uh, make them feel confident about sharing with us and us with them. Mm -hmm. And that's when uh, through the works in the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray and continuously ask for His leading in each of our lives to help us share about this unshakable kingdom to all our friends and families and to those who are in need to know about this unshakable mm -hmm. kingdom. Thank you for that thought, uh, Maria. And uh, what practical ways has God shown you mm -hmm. to respond to his what practical ways has God showed me? Uh, I'll just take us back to the Bible. Uh, you know, we've been reading from Hebrews chapter 12, and mm. we've read on the goodness of God in terms of the judgment. Mm. Right after Hebrews chapter 12, we have Hebrews chapter 13, and the Word of God starts by saying, let brotherly love continue. Mm. Amen. Uh, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Mm. Therefore, you know, having it, some uh, unwe unknowingly, you may have entertained angels. Mm. Remember those that are in bonds around them, mm. uh, which suffer from adversary. Uh, I'm reading from verse four now. Marriage is to be honorable. Mm. Let your con conversions, uh, you know, your conversations be not covered. Yes. These are all things. Tala has mentioned that um, the thing about, uh, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is that it's more to do with um, God and mm. less to do with self. Mm. Uh, one of the practical ways that, uh, you know, God has showed me the, to relate the goodness of God to others or to respond to his goodness is to put self mm. behind and mm. to put him first. And mm. when we do that, uh, you know, a brotherly love will continue mm. because others will come first. Sure. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for mm, that uh, wonderful thought. And thank you to Tartala, and I believe that uh, brings us to the end of our program today. And just to conclude and to close our discussions today, I have a last question mm. for both of you. Uh, we'll start from Tartala and then you can also share your thoughts, Maria, oh. this uh, today. How can we encourage others to become part of God's unshakable kingdom? Mm. Um, you know, it's easy to encourage others especially in the context of today, not in, in words, but in action. Eh? Mm. Um, I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 5, verse mm. 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works mm. and glorify Amen. your Father mm. in heaven. And so for us, how can we encourage others to become part of God's unshakable kingdom? Is more in what we do for them. Mm. Mm. Okay? When we see them uh, in need, we, we give a, we lend a hand. Mm -hmm. um, when we see them uh, lonely, we go and pray for them and pray with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well, visit those that are, are suffering from any illness or sicknesses. Um, provide comfort to those who are grieving for the loss of their loved ones. And uh, those practical ways are are some of the ways that practical uh, living and practical um, actions, <laughs> well, yeah, it's how you encourage them to come and be part of uh, God's unshakable kingdom. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Tata. Um, I agree with Tala. You know, uh, as he's mentioned, 
to reach out to others and not in words, but in action, you know, uh, as much as it is important to preach the word of God, some of the greatest sermons are not preached from the pulpit. They are seen in the lives of those around us, those that lend a hand, you know, and, uh, you know, the book of uh, Hebrews in chapter 13, we just read, you know, the Bible says, you know, entertain strangers, you don't know, you might be entertaining angels. And um, that's the, the reality of, uh, you know, how that's the best way that we can, uh, sh- you know, that we can encourage others to be a part of the kingdom of God mm-hmm. is to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Amen. and to try to, you know, reflect the love that Christ has shown us, mm-hmm. not in our words, but in our actions and mm-hmm. to truly live out a life of uh, sanctified life and a life of serving others. Amen. Amen. We live uh, that we've been blessed with our uh, discussions mm-hmm. today and thank you so much for all those wonderful thoughts. Let us also not forget our brothers and sisters mm-hmm. to continue and uh, help them get back on track as we're all working to be part of this unshakable mm-hmm. kingdom. Thank yeah. you so much uh, uh, to the both of you, Taltala, and also Maria for availing yourselves you. uh, today. I believe that we've been parted into separate teams and it's been a long time to <laughs> have us again together <laughs> this <laughs> Sabbath. And uh, yes, thank you so much for availing yourselves. And uh, it is my prayer that the Lord will continuously and abundantly bless you. Mm-hmm as we uh, discuss more about God's Word. And also to our friends and families and to those of you who are joining us from home, let us continuously pray. Ask for His CB assistance and the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. Let's continue to go to Mount Zion and let's continue to go to God who is the judge of all. And with that, let's work hand in hand so that we can all inherit this unshakable kingdom as we're all working towards this common goal to be part of this unshakable kingdom. And with all of those, let us pray, let brotherly love continue so that we can survive the shaking of the heavens and the earth. And finally, through whatever things we go through, the situations and what all that we go through, learn to respond to God's goodness and grace. We leave you all in good hands and it is our prayer that the Lord will continuously and abundantly bless you uh, as you all journey with him this uh, Sabbath. And uh, we wish you a happy new week in advance. To close off our discussions for today, Taltala, if you could just uh, end our discussion with a word of prayer. Our merciful Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to share from your blessing, the blessing of listening, sharing, and be inspired by your word and lord thank you for the working of your holy spirit using us to be a tool to share your word and as well with those that are joining with us today may you be with them may you encourage them may you continue to guide in each and every one of our lives Um, thank you lord that um, you will um, help us to continue to prepare and be ready for your coming And Lord, may your will be done in us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Putting God first can be difficult. What can we learn from Esther that will help us put God first in our lives today? When Esther joined the selection process that would eventually make her queen of the Persian Empire, many doubts must have rushed through her mind. Her people were exiles and their hopes were dim. It looked like God had abandoned them to Persian rule while still requiring obedience. But Esther was beautiful, both inside and out. Even a ruthless king could see that. So, Xerxes chose her to become his queen. Esther enjoyed her palace and privileges she could only have imagined in previous years. After a while, King Xerxes was deceived by an advisor when he issued a death decree against all Hebrews. When challenged to beg the king for mercy, Esther was afraid. It's difficult to put God first when we struggle with poverty and the lack of resources. Yet, wealth and power often also lead people away from him. How do you put God first when you have more wealth and influence than those around you? Well, follow the example of Esther. She said, Go, gather all the Jews, and fast for me for three days. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther was not immune to fear, but she was as courageous as she was beautiful. 
she bravely decided to put God first, investing all, even her life if necessary, to save others. Her words, if I perish, I perish, are engraved in the story of God's people to encourage those who, through the ages, would also be called to do the same. And we know how the story ended. Esther put God first. Her example compels us to do the same. As the deacons collect the tithe and promise, we are challenged to put God first.
since Jesus came into my heart I got to be so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Can you think of some people from your church that you haven't seen in a while? Is there a person who is inevitably going through a difficult life transition right now? Or any elderly or sick needing your attention and care? Have you spoken to them recently? It's time to create a plan. Connect with them using a language that everyone can understand. It's time to serve Show them that they are loved and never forgotten. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Share the good news of Jesus Christ to all the world. What a wonderful time this will be. We cannot wait. Global Youth Day 2022. Loving the Forgotten. For nearly 10 years, Global Youth Day has been a special day of ministry that encourages all of us, but especially you, our creative and energetic young people, to be the sermon. You not only share the sermon, you are the sermon in so many ways. This year, we're encouraged to love the forgotten. That's exactly what Jesus calls us to do in Matthew 25 when he tells the story of the sheep and the goats to care for those who are sick or in prison, those who are hungry and thirsty and in need. Jesus says to his faithful servants, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. You see, The Desire of Ages, that incredible book on the life of Christ, tells us that he views the ministry of, of uplifting fallen humanity as so important that our eternal destiny is determined by it, by how we touch those in need. On March 19, let's take time on Global Youth Day to remember those the world has forgotten. Let's lift people's burdens, encourage the brokenhearted, share the love of Jesus and the hope we have that He, Christ, is coming soon. Whether you plan to serve in person or through creative virtual means, I'm looking forward to your opportunity to help others realize that you are part of total member involvement and making a great difference for Jesus. God bless each of you. And remember, on Global Youth Day, you are part of God's final proclamation for Jesus is coming soon. Maranatha.
is the face that I see in the mirror The one I want others to see Do I show in the way that I walk in my life The love that you've given to me My heart's desire is to be And so, I want to draw your attention to verse 7 of Acts chapter 20. Reading from the New English Translation, feel free to follow along with the translation of your choice. That's cool. They should have it for you up on the screen. If you can see it, say, uh-oh. Oh, that's not everybody. Has to be at least 600, 700 people in here. That didn't sound like a 700 person uh-oh. If you can see it, say, uh-oh. Okay, that was a little better. 
On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul began to speak to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, he extended his message until when? Until when? Anybody in the mood for an eight hour word today? Just an eight hour word. Okay, I didn't get no help. No witnesses. Amen. 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 Let's just move on then. Verse 8. Some people are hungry already. Verse 8. Now there were many lamps. That's a very key text. A lot of times we skim over details in the Bible. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Verse 9. A young man named what? What is his name? Eutychus. That name means fortunate. Okay? So I want to break that down now. So a young man named Fortunate who was sitting in the window was sinking into a deep sleep until Paul continued to speak for a long time. Fast asleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up what? Mm, mercy. Verse 10. But Paul went down. He threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him and said, do not be distressed. For he is still alive. Let's look at our final text, verse 12. I like this text. It's short, sweet, to the point, and beautiful. They took the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. They took the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to speak underneath the theme, Go get Eutychus. Go get Eutychus. Father, everything that you've shown me, May it happen here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go get Eutychus. Now, I need to take a seat because we're going to have a real talk discussion. Today is going to be one of them discussions where you're like, this is family business. You know those discussions? It's a real talk discussion. We're going to talk about sleeping in church. Is that all right? Can we talk about it? Sleeping in church. Now, I'm an individual who's a fan of a good dozer. Uh, it is entertainment, live and in living color. HD type of clarity. When you catch a person, it's a little dark in here today, so you may not be able to catch people as you usually do. But although people fall asleep on the job, we've seen that. Although they fall asleep in the classroom, we've also seen that. There's no better entertainment underneath the sun than to watch people fighting it in church. No better entertainment. There are four types of dozers that we may even be able to see today. And, and if it's not today, it was, it was last weekend. And if it wasn't last weekend, it's definitely going to be next weekend. There are four types of dozers that we come across. The first type is called the Hollywood dozer. Let me show you these Hollywood dozers, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these are the individuals who are falling asleep. But then when they kind of startle awake, they're trying to act like they've been with you the whole time. <laughs> Hollywood. So they, they nodding. Yeah, yeah, love lifted me. Love lifted me. Yeah, no, no. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Say that. Say that. Say that. <laughs> Hollywood. It's like, why act? Why act? Just admit it. You were falling asleep. Another type of dozer. This, this individual, sometimes, uh, it makes me laugh only because they come in so bold. These are the shameless dozers, okay? Now, shameless dozers are individuals who come in and you know they have every intention to sleep every intention. Now what they'll usually try to do, not to call out my ladies, but a lot of my ladies are the shameless dozers, is because you can hide it. First step, you get this huge purse, right? Huge purse that has like a blankie in it and some snacks. Anybody got a snack in the place today? Got a snack with you? Got a, got a little thermos in there, you know, with some warm drink. I mean, you have every intention to get as comfortable as possible to kind of scoot on your row, make sure you got your space. You're going to have a great nap today because you haven't had a good one all week. Then there are the devotional dozers. Devotional dozers are individuals who try to take religious postures 
so that nobody can tell they're sleeping. <laughs> you ever seen the open Bible dozer? <laughs> Man, and you know these guys because the bottom lip is always a little bit too low, right? <laughs> That's what gives them away. It's just that bottom lip just hanging out there. And they're trying to act like they're just in devotional study. That they are more meditative than the rest of us. Yeah, the final one, though, is my favorite. And that's the whiplash dozer. <laughs> and I want to give you the side view of the whiplash dozer. Because this is the best view. I mean, it looks kind of funny if you're behind them. And if you kind of catch them when you turn around, that's kind of funny. But if you're on the side of them, ain't nothing better. They're in the church, and they just, bam, oh, oh, man. And then they try to wake up and act like everything is cool, that they weren't asleep and anything like that. And afterwards, you're asking them, yo, do you need medical attention? Man, your vertebrae all right, brother? I know a chiropractor. Because that thing is just super funny. And I used to laugh all the time in church when I am coming up against these dozers until I got into sleep science. Then I didn't think it was too funny anymore. It was actually a little bit startling, maybe even frightening. When you get sleepy, but you have not chosen to go to sleep, notice this, when you get sleepy, but you have not chosen to go to sleep, it is actually your body overriding your right to choose. Your subconscious mind is actually keeping some tallies of the toxicity level in your blood. Now, this is important because your blood is what tells your brain how healthy you are right now. And as the toxicity level in your blood rises, your, bl your brain is kind of metering, metering it. And it's trying to test it. It's trying to watch it. Because when it gets too high, that's a sign that you've taken on too much damage. Let me break this down this way. Many of you will eat after this service, and some of you will catch what is called the itis. <laughs> you know somebody's been bit by the itis because they'll be sitting at the table and they'll be staring at nothing. <laughs> no, just watch it after, after, uh, after your meal today. Look around the table and watch you just start staring off for no reason. You know they've been bit. The itis, though, watch this, the itis is best known to follow soul food. Any lovers of soul food? Amen, amen. Some of you guys are expecting to eat some after service. But the thing about soul food is it does carry high levels of toxicity. If, in fact, you were to just eat a salad for lunch, you would not catch the itis as someone who eats uh, yams and mac and cheese and, and the fried stuff, chicken or veggie. It doesn't matter. I mean, if you eat that and then you top it off with one of those great, I'm talking about moist pieces of cornbread, that is when you know you've had a great meal. But all of that goodness is really toxic. I know y'all don't like that word. You're like, oh, dang, this brother just messed up my lunch. Hey, I'm just saying, take everything, be temperate in all things, you know, enjoy it, but just recognize that when you eat it and you get sleepy, just know what's going on, okay? So when individuals start dozing, it is connected to the fact that their body is alarming them to the fact that you are damaged. Just living on a day-to-day -day basis causes you to incur damage. That's the reality of the planet we're living in. That's the reality of sin. That even when you try your best, the human body is really the ultimate machine. And just by running, it incurs damage. When this damage gets to a heightened level, your body says, I need to go to sleep. Watch this. Because sleep is how the body heals itself. Sleep is how the body heals itself. So if you are in the building today and you're still kind of sleepy or a lot sleepy, I want you to know you're feeling this way because your body is trying to tell you, I got a lot of damage going on and I need you to go to sleep so I can do my thing. Because whenever you're awake, I incur more damage. So I need to put you down. I need to put you into timeout so I can do the business of ramping up this immune system and fixing the damage. 
A lot of times we've looked at sleeping, especially in church, as a negative thing. But what about if we flip the script and, and look at sleeping as a sign that someone is damaged? Yeah, see, that's why I can't laugh anymore when you start to doze. I want to, but I now recognize what it means, that you've had a hard week. You've been stressed out. You've been up against a lot of challenges, and all of that has caused you to incur levels of damage. And the fact that you are in the house of God, and you can't seem to stay awake for the word of God, or for the message of God, or for the songs of God, is because you've accrued a high level of damage. And so as I look at Eutychus in Acts chapter 20, I can't hate on this brother too quickly. Most people will read the story and try to preach a sermon, preach a word that talks about the importance of the next generation staying awake in church. The importance of your involvement, the fact that the church needs you, the fact that if you just fall asleep and fall out of this thing, then what future hope do we have? But I want to turn the narrative just a little bit and put Eutychus back in that window, and I want us to look at him not as an individual who's rebelling against the church, but an individual who's damaged and still attending church. I want us to turn the narrative to notice that there's a young man who actually can't help himself. Do you recognize that in the parable of the ten virgins, we do not, listen to this, we do not give the five wise props because they stayed awake all night. Notice that in the parable, all of them fall asleep. We give them props for the state they were in when they woke up. And I want you to know this, notice this because I know a lot of religious rhetoric. We need to stay awake. We need to keep our eyes open. But recognize there's an aspect of this sin thing that we need to concede. There was a reason why the disciples couldn't stay awake with Jesus. And Jesus said it right when he came back to them and said, man, listen, I understand. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And for far too long, I think we have categorized sleepy people in church as individuals who really aren't dedicated. But what if being sleepy is a sign? What if dozing is a sign that you're trying to fight, you just can't win? It's just too much damage. But this is where verse 8 steps in. And it attempts to set us up for a great story void of tragedy. And verse 8 in Acts chapter 20, I want you to look at this with me because this thing is powerful. It says, now there were many lamps in the upstairs room. Now some of us may say, well this is pre-electricity, therefore I don't expect anyone to be able to notice someone else who's kind of on the perimeter or on the periphery of the gathering off in a window seal. I can't notice them because there's no light at night. But the Bible writer, Luke here, is very strategic to let us know. And I don't know how this dude fell because there were many lamps in the room. Lamps in the Bible always symbolize truth. Light always symbolizes truth. So watch this now. There is a gathering of believers. The church is in session. There is a guest speaker who's traveled from far away. This guest speaker has been doing an evangelistic campaign, but it's the final night of the campaign. There's a whole lot of truth in the building, and yet nobody notices a member who's struggling with damage. Nobody notices it, and there's no excuse because there's so much truth there that somebody should have looked up long enough to say, somebody needs to help a brother who's about to fall out of the church and yet can't help himself. 
The toxicity level of the environment that he's currently trying to function in is too high. He has no choice. His body is responding naturally to his surrounding circumstance. Eutychus has no hope to beat this thing by himself. The only thing Eutychus has hope in is that somebody in the church will take time to notice his need. And I want to pause here because we need to come against a stronghold currently in the church. Many of us feel great. We feel great today because we are attending church. A matter of fact, it's one of the key measurements by which we try to uh, uh, observe or assess someone's spirituality. There are parents here who are excited that they keep getting calls from their kids saying, I went to church today. There are friends here who put a lot of effort into getting into somebody's dorm room and saying, wake up, you need to get to church. There are faculty members and staff members that are just desperately praying for the students on this campus to make it to church because we have been taught that this shows health. This shows that you're striving. This shows that you're connected. But what if it's possible to be here and be disconnected? What if it's possible to actually attend the service but just be moments away from the greatest fall you've ever had in life, a fall that you can't come back from. What if it's that this this service today, you are here and you are falling asleep because you've been taking on some major life damage. And what if it's that this service is the service where you need somebody to look into your eyes and say, wait a second, you don't look so, so good. Do you need us to step out of service to talk? Do you need us to take you off of praise team so that you can really get it together? Do you need us not to ask you to pray? Do you need us not to ask you to read? the text. I believe there are a lot of individuals who are getting by in church because they're able to act the part. They're able to act healthy, smile healthy, pray healthy, read healthy, and even preach healthy when all the while we are damaged and moments away from falling. And the church has no excuse. Why? Because there are many lights in the room. For Jesus looks to us and say, know you not that you are the light of the world? Listen, family, if we supposedly are the people of truth, why is it that so many people go unnoticed? I don't understand. It's a contradiction of terms. If there are many lights in the room, if there are a lot of people who know truth, if there are not a lot of people who can break down the Bible, if there are a lot of people that can speak a word in due season, why is it that so many people from week to week fall out of church unnoticed? The text says that the service is the major distraction. I want to repeat that. The story says that the service, the pomp and the circumstance of a weekly meeting. It said we met on the first day of the week. This is not this is not uncommon in Acts. We see it at the beginning of the story in Acts. In Acts chapter 4, it was the custom for the disciples and the believers to get together for fellowship on Sundays. The first day of the week. This is a common gathering. So watch this. We gather here all the time. We experience a whole lot of truth. But the people who are damaged never get to benefit from all that truth. The service was the major distraction. Notice there's a guy in an upper room. Now, the dimensions of the upper room of this time, based on archaeologists, this upper room is not like this room here. It's not like Eutychus is somewhere far off in the balcony sitting in a window seal. No, these these were very cozy spaces. A matter of fact, with so many lamps in the upper room, scholars suggest that it would have been very hot and stuffy. It would have been an environment that was perfect for falling asleep. Because you have these open flames that are just burning. People are hot, people are kind of stuffy, and somebody's falling asleep. Someone should have noticed Eutychus. 
But no one notices because everyone has gathered. Watch this. They have not gathered to check in and make sure each other is okay. They have gathered to have a service. Please, Alumni Association, can we admit this? Can we admit this? This connected theme for this weekend came out of a desperate desire of the association to acknowledge one truth, that when we have come together in the past, it has been a service. But no one has ever broached the conversation about connectedness. Disconnected from the church, disconnected from God, disconnected from each other. This theme this weekend was a concession that we understand what it's like to be a part of this church in Acts chapter 20. To come together at a, at a prescribed frequency to have a service. But nobody ever recognizes the damage among us. And a matter of fact, we have built cultures to where it's not even cool to admit you're damaged. So now, watch this, man. The, the enemy is so subtle. And I do want you to see this as a, a making of Satan. I do want you to see this. The enemy is so subtle. What he does is he causes the church. He can't defeat the church through persecution. So all he does is changes the motivation and the focus of the church. So he changes it away from pouring into each other. Why do I say that? Acts chapter 4 says that the church at the height of its, uh, at the height of its establishment was a place where no one had need for anything. Now we've usually, we've usually, because the text moves on to talk about people sold their lands and gave their possessions, we limit this to just materialism, that no one had need for any material. But what about if it spoke about the, the abstract as well as the concrete, that no one had need for any encouragement, that no one had need for any listening ear, that no one had need for any understanding? What if the church at the height, at the height of its experience is just very hypersensitive to notice people's needs. Some of y'all feel like I'm taking a couple steps too far on this, but I, I want to back it with the word. Matthew chapter 25, notice that there are two groups of individuals and both individuals claim to be church. After judgment, you have two sides. And I hate how we add things to the text and it really takes away from our interpretation. One side says, we know you. The other side says, we know you. But God looks to one side and says, depart from me. I don't know you. It's two sides of church. One side relishes in playing church. Matthew 7 did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? These are all the modalities of church. Matthew 25. The people that are saved are the people that saw that you were hungry and fed you. Amen. Saw that you were thirsty and gave you something to drink. Saw that you were naked and gave you clothing. Saw that you were in prison and went to visit you. Saw that you were sick and guess what? They also visited you. Notice the two sides. And I love how Jesus, when he talks about the judgment, he's often comparing, comparing church folk with church folk. But we interpret it as if he's comparing a, a, a pagan folk with church folk. No, recognize this, that at the end of time, God is going to look at churches and he's going to divide the people, the members of those churches into two groups. Individuals that cared for each other's needs and individuals who were just into church. The great distraction is that there's a guest speaker in town who's going to be leaving and we got to make sure we give him all of our intention because he has great things to say. He brings a word. A matter of fact, he heals people. This is why we're all here. We have gathered here to experience church. And everybody seems to forget about a young cat who's disconnected because of damage. And watch what happens. The text says, the text says in verse 9, Acts chapter 20, verse 9, fast asleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. 
I asked myself the question, I wonder how long it took for them to notice he was gone. I actually don't believe there was this great scream that happened. Many of you will know that when you're really drowsy and you're startled back awake, you really don't say much. You're just disoriented. And I'm looking at this brother's fall and I'm like, it's only a, maybe a second or two that passes. But if he manages to wake up while he's falling, how desperate that must have felt. You feel that gravity feeling, you feel your tummy going up into your throat, and you wake up and don't know what happens, and the next thing he knows, everything is black. And I want to know how long did it take for the church to recognize that Eutychus was gone? How long does it take for us on alumni weekend to look into the eyes of those that we greet, converse with, speak to? How long does it take for you to really look at them to see if they've fallen? Because this story now becomes a metaphor for our spirituality. That what we see in, in the natural is what's going on in the spiritual. That many of us are just gathering every week. That's all we're doing is we're just gathering, but nothing's happening on the inside. We are like dead people walking. There's no life. There's no renewal. There's no rejuvenation. There's no thanksgiving. We may stand in praise, but that's because we like the song. That doesn't mean we actually have the experience. And we wonder why so many of our churches are dead. And we act like it's the pastor's fault. We act like it's the praise team's fault. We act like it's the youth leader's fault. That if these people got it together, then we'd be alive. Maybe it's the congregation's fault. Maybe it's the congregation's fault for never being interested in the very intimate and personal details of those that they worship with to where at, at the end of the day, everybody's just walking dead. There is a crisis in our church. The crisis is because we got away from a gathering that was based on each other and based on making sure that each other is okay. Because we got away from that, now we are so invested into liturgy, order of service, worship elements, and worship context. We are so into that that I believe we are primed and just, we are ripe for the picking when it comes to this oncoming persecution that everybody has been talking about. Pope's here, Sunday blue law, not gonna be able to worship on Sabbath, but check this out. I think the church should be okay even if they lock our churches because nobody can stop me from chilling with you in some basement somewhere making sure that you're okay. Be but because we're so dependent on the liturgy, on the building, on the lighting, on the sound, on the visual effects, as soon as that's taken from us, we'll really see the state of the church. We'll see how dead we are. We'll see that there's no power, there's no transformation, there is really no truth. Because truth is supposed to set you free. John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if there's no freedom in your environment, I question whether you have truth. And maybe we're redefining truth, which has been very uncomfortable for the church to do as the world attempts to do the same. But maybe the truth of it all is that Christ's experience, him coming to the planet, was less about doctrines and rules that need to be memorized and more about God expressing to his utmost the requirement of intimacy, relationship, and compassion. Maybe that's truth. Maybe all of that leads us to better understand the rules 
better understand the regulations and really better apply God's will for his church. Because if there was one thing that the Pharisees always hated on Jesus about is they never felt he upheld the law enough but spent too much time chilling with dead people. I want to close now with this thought and idea. It comes from Acts chapter 20 and verse 10. I think the logical conclusion of this message is someone to ask, well, what does real church look like? What does real church look like? And I'm so glad that before Luke left the story, he let us see it. He let us see it. Acts chapter 20 and verse 10, as the musician comes to play, it says, but Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him, and said, do not be distressed, for he is alive. Now, I want you to notice that this is one of the few times in the Bible where you'll find someone resurrected from the dead without a prayer and without a word. So immediately, it's letting me know that there's some type of power being expressed here that does not require a prayer, an audible, verbal display that someone has, the articulation to speak to God and get him to respond. If there's a prayer uttered, it's only inside of here. I'm also looking at the text and it's, there's no word, there's no command. It's not like someone just has the power and authority to stand over someone and say, yo, get up. In the name of Jesus, I command you, come forth and rise. It's not one of those things. There's not this, there's not this pomp and circumstance. There's not this show. There, there aren't a lot of, of, of amenities that are surrounding it. I mean, this brother simply does three things. He gets down on Eutychus' level. And, and I want you to see this. I want you to see that he gets down on Eutychus' level. The Bible says that he threw himself on the young man. Notice that this is one of the most intimate postures two human beings can share, laying on each other. And the Bible says that he makes himself so vulnerable. And watch, he, his sermon got interrupted. That's what I love about the story. All liturgy stops. All worship stops. All praise stops. All preaching stops. Because there's one person that needs help. And the Bible says that the preacher goes downstairs and throws himself onto Eutychus. He throws himself onto him. He throws his life into Eutychus' life at a level of intimacy that will ever be, rarely be, infrequently be seen between Paul and anybody that you would lay on this person. And notice when he lays on him, the Bible says he puts his arms around him. Do you see that? It's right there. He put his arms around him. What does that represent? It represents a hug. He throws himself on the guy and gives him a hug. I think there's some individuals here and I know this is true. I know this to be true in my heart. There are some people here who are trying to figure out what is the next step in winning back somebody I love? What's the next step for me feeling again? Not even concerned about someone else. What's the next step for me? How is it that I can come back from this very dead experience in my spirituality? And I want you to know that I believe the answer is very simple. That when compassion, the left arm, meets affection, the right arm, you really need a hug. And we champion the power of Bible study. We champion the power of preaching and oratory skill. We love individuals who can lead us in songs that make our very spirits transcend the planet. And we're always giving props to the prophetic ministry. And we're always lifting up those that can somehow tell the future or even lay their hands on people and heal them from infirmities. But I want you to know one of the most powerful tools a Christian has 
is, to, is the ability to recognize when someone needs to be hugged. One of the most powerful tools a Christian has is the ability to look at someone and recognize you need a hug. There's no words in that. You don't have to have some major counseling ability. You don't have to be super astute in the Word of God. All you have to know is that the salvation of Jesus Christ lives in you. That there's a God that has equipped every single Christian on the planet to go throughout the world and give hugs to people that need them. And this is not some soft gospel. This is not a gospel without power. For the Word of God says that in that moment of hugging, the boy comes back to life. This is really crazy for me because I'm looking at the story and say, wait a second. He doesn't just need to breathe again. It's not just like we need to get his heart pumping again. Most likely based on the science of gravity and human beings and, and weight distribution, when Eutychus fell out of the window seal, he would have tipped, which would have meant that he most likely fell on his neck or on his upper shoulder area which would have completely shattered his spinal cord or given him a major fracture to his skull. He would have died based on impact. Eutychus needs way more than a heartbeat. He needs way more than breath. He needs bones to be realigned. He needs his spinal cord to be reconstructed. He needs some things to be put back together again that many would say, that's impossible. But through one hug, one act of compassion and affection, there was one member in the building who looked up and said, wait a second, I've been preaching and I used to see a young man back there. I don't see him anymore. We need to stop everything and make sure we bring him back. Because when Paul gets downstairs, and he sees Eutychus. Eutychus doesn't need a Bible study right now. Doesn't need it. Eutychus doesn't need pathfinders right now. Don't do him no good. Eutychus doesn't need Sabbath school right now. That is a mute point. Eutychus doesn't need 28 fundamental beliefs right now. That's not going to help him. Eutychus doesn't need a bigger facility. Eutychus doesn't need more relevant ministry. Eutychus doesn't need an engaging pastor. Eutychus doesn't need a praise and worship team. What does Eutychus need? Eutychus needs life. That's the only thing that he needs. And if we, the church, would just embrace the fact that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that wants to live in us. And it's not just for us. It's for dead people that we'll meet. It's for the times where there will be no word. For the times when all that we usually do will be ineffective. It's the times when all we can give is a hug that brings new life. The appeal today is twofold, going to call for great transparency. But in this moment, I pray that the Spirit of God would begin to just breathe over us. That God would honor our gathering and honor the fact that we desire to be different when we gather. I'm going to ask for some people to be very bold. There's some individuals that can relate to Eutychus. You've arrived at Alumni Weekend this year, and you're willing to admit, you know, I'm getting sleepy, y'all. I'm about to fall. I want you to stand where you are. Because we're going to have a different type of church in these last few moments. You're standing saying, I'm sleepy. I'm about to fall out of this thing. You may have not been able to tell. I've learned how to hide it pretty well. And I've been thankful that no one has asked me any question 
about where I really am spiritually. But on this weekend, I need to stand and admit to those who I'm worshiping with, I need help. I need some desperate help. Because I'm about to fall. And I think I may not be able to come back from it. As you stand, I want you to embrace the exposure. I want you to understand that this is actually what church is supposed to be. That even our practice of dressing up for church has probably gone too far and enabled many of us to look on the outside what we do not have on the inside. And for those who are seated, I want you to look at those who are standing near you. And I want you to recognize that what they're not needing is for you to embrace them after and ask them all the stuff that's going on. They don't need that. They don't need you to inquire about details. And they're probably not interested in this point. We're receiving a Bible study about how God restores. I think what they're really wanting in this moment is for you to notice they're standing and for you to be willing to give them a hug. Only if you know the person who's standing near you, like you have a relationship with, you, with them. And please be honest about this. This is not the time to pose. But if you really feel like you've made an investment in their life and they're near you, I actually want you to stand and give them a hug. If you are currently standing by someone else who is standing, you know that they can relate to you. I want you to turn and I want you to give them a hug. And I don't want these hugs to be pats. I want these hugs to be hugs that actually allow life to go from one person to another person. Because it's all about getting connected in the body of Christ. It's about taking serious the call. To hold my brother's hand, to hold my sister's hand, and make sure we all get there together. Can you all just stand to your feet if you're seated? Can you stand at this point, at this moment? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you would allow us all to receive this word and to start building different churches, living churches, vibrant churches, friendly churches, outstanding churches, not churches that are using love to compromise, but churches that recognize that where sin abounds, grace can overwhelm it. It can abound much more. And that through the expression of affection and compassion, we can actually communicate the love of Christ in a way that cannot be done through words, but cannot be done through liturgy. We can actually open up a door for someone to actually receive the Spirit of God. And that Spirit has promised to lead us into all truth. I pray you would give us this, God, that you would give us true connectedness. That you would allow us to go get Eutychus. And those that we've seen fall, that you would give us the ability to give them a hug and watch them come back to life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please remain standing.
non rei tomo na tomo te alo som soba er na na maki me ra lako ilo malangi ni sam bulo bena ka na turang ken marama ni bulo bena ka na dorbo ken ngone lewa ni bulo bena ka talanga na lubeki mai mi rangoni oni maro taka moni ndo sar sar tiko en hop chena lo maro mo na ndo moni kalobi ko na ngono ngo me dana vei talanoa en a i wulu tanga bimbi sa kalonga ta ko i ra sa ya lo bulu bulu mu ni sa non ra na mate ni tumo lo malangi se na ndrabun ndrabua bagayalo ba kalamani en dar vital no tiko de sigi limini ko en da sana tiki bu en e bu nau e bu ta kota na kalou en mai di wa se lima ono wili ko bi kenda ni tiki ni wol tamu mai di wa se lima tiki ne tolu sa kalou nga ta ko i ra sa ya lo mol molu mu ni sa non ra ma te ni tu ba lo malangi ono bi sura tiki kenda ma en da na ba rongo do la nga e bi da na i ba ga ba ga nde o ni bola tamu ba ba alangi o bi ta tiko mai Mera ni vuke da ke se ta be da ke na non da vaga matata taka na ya lo mul mulumu ko e to ga itiko ko e no mosu mabiti ka e na ndo ni vaga ndeo baba lagi blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven ndo ta le ka ya great blessings belong to those who know they are spiritually in need god's kingdom belongs to them contemporary english version blessed are those who recognize they are spiritually helpless the kingdom of heaven belongs to them god's word god blesses those people who depend only on him they belong to the kingdom of heaven dota lekaya happy are those who know they are spiritually poor the kingdom of heaven belongs to us sini ken bal bal ni boga dalan ken ni boga dia boga biti o maro ta ganga men da rongo da bata ken ni boga dia boga biti ken ken ni boga dia boga walagi eto to ka boleta ka di wango dor ken ni boga dia ka ya ni ra kaloga to ire ra vakila ni ra sang ni tu beira do na kau kau boga yalo me to mana ke no no re logo boga yalo bot ke ni turanga ya ngo do ni tuku tuku bi 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 ko bot ke ya we dai dai na da bot ra ken ni bal bal na ndra ndra bua en bos bo walagi pua ko tuku ni tigo klasim do bike de do taleta ka metku ni wa ni turang maram se dorbu go de le on ndra ndra bua men do tuku ni wa ni tagalala nothing go si ni bos bo naka se ka talanga ni ka naka bike de ni kua ni do e se ka no na vale se ka ba no na lori se si ni tigo wa do na talebo ni naka do na laptop ni naka se ni ya ya so le le bui vale se se ka ni tagi bi ya ka na ka tu bua enda na redi ko so be de bi di ko enda ka ya ni ndrabu ndrabu lu le bona ona enda boga tou ta ka na butu ni au ke na ndrabu ndrabu enda ka e tou ke na ndua material goods ya e bi sanga sanga boga le bu boti ke na ka e ka yo chisu karisto blessed are the poor sakalungata ko i ra sa ndrabu ndrabu boga ya lo ni sa nonra na mate ni tu boga lo malangi da re da no no de se ka ni tale ta ka na mate ni tu na bulan ndrum ndrumua ena no dei tiku tiku e boga sanga na bi go ni sala tau do ko le lebu la lai ena ke na bi na ka ti me bu e ti na bulan ndrum ndrumua lebu na bi boga toro da ka taki na bi i toro da ka taki ra ramba e yazo na ke na bi na ka ti me bu e ti na bulan ndrum ndrumua ya na ka re re ba ka talanga ba kalmani mo la tin de adu me no lo min lo tu ba kristo saba ka me sai ulu ta ka talanga ni bi te ba li ni muna o ya ni sa sa ka ni na 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 wuda e na tau be ba ka na wuda na ilamo ke na kaula ma na buru buru go yo mara uni volta bu e do ta ni na ka ka ba go si me no no da sa na ba ya lo sai ni ke ba ba le ni za ta na kalo na bulo butu ni o sa ka si no ka na ka ga ka ti o vi na ka to ko ti ke da mai ba ga lai lai e na tuku tuku ko e no da na i wa si ni ga go Bola tini kai tigo chisu sa kalonga ta koira sa yalo mul mulu muse ndrabun ndrabua boga yalo au ni berkat boko tiki ande ndo ni talno e talno to to kasar e bola o luke e na luke wa se tin ka walu tiki ne ziwa la ko sumu ke ndo talno e ro tura nga ro le masu ke tigo ni volta mo to bole mo wulika ka bago na tiki ne tini Ele uru na tamata rosa ala ko da kina bali ni soro be maso ndor farisi ndor do kumuru ni boga da boda ba tigre tigre ndua satu na farisi ka maso ba kai ko e ba ka ngo na kalou 
au mwaka muli muli beiko ni usa sang ni wakata kira na tamata eso era sa do kobe kobe era sa do butakolo era sa do elewa se era sa do elewa se wakata ki koya na do kumuna na ibaka tapa tapa andu so bira okay asa tu mga yawa ko koya na kumuna na ibaka tapa tapa asa sang ni via tada ki kilo malangi ya sa tavia na loma se rena kakaya ke muni na kalo Lomani ya umai. Kwa yao na tamatei wala wala da. Tine tine kapa. Au sa kaibu kimdou. Sa lako sobu kino nono vale na tamatei ongo. Kasa waka ndonui. Ya kwa kwa ya kandua. Sa sengai. Nina waka mulu mulu mutiki kwa ya andua. Sa waka lebu lebu kwa ya. Ya kwa kwa ya sa waka mulu mulu mutiki kwa ya. Ya na waka lebu lebu. Sama naka. Rua na turanga ya darithi yore kendro italunua. Dona farisi. Dona dokumuna ni waka dapodawa. Na tamata vinaka ndua ndua ya rao ni produce taki ya na nondra itiku tiku na chiu. Kei na tamata dhati ndua ndua mwewe ira na kai chiu ya na ngao no ya. Andona comparison dha ya takabu tiku chisu. Tamata ndo kai ndua ndua. Ndona farisi. Vata kei na tamata kai chiu. Se chiu ia ya dhaka dhaka ya na mkundra na kai roma. Mekumuna na ibaka dhabu. Dua yang telah rawa buat nak keluar, yang nak kaya bolai, yang nak lawa, yang dua biru sah, tambah tak butuh butang sana, tambah tak ibal balda, tambah tak zati, mula tadi tambah tak liumuri. Dua biru, farisi, tawa seita ni mai burbur, mai bayir nak kena bo, dua biru, nanda ukumur nai baka tak butam, kaya, zaka zaka, yang nak rukun ni mula tadi tu koroma. Do virau é loura e daqui me vê ira naquela na boa. Do virau é sangue sarangá. Ni loura e daqui. Na tamata vinaga do dua, que é na tamata dati, se tamata seva que do dua, me vê ira na tziu. Não não maço, não goni sala, não laco aqui na boa, na calou. Ou na tobole a moulica talha, não não maço, não farisi. Rongada na caia caia. Au vaca moli moli veico. Niu sa, sangue de bacate aqui na tamata e só. Era sa dao kobe kobe. Era sa dao mutakolo. Era sa dao elewa. Era sa sepakate ki kwen na kumuna na ibaka dapodapa. Au sa lolo mga ruwe na biwiki. Au solia na ikatini ni kake dhanga. Au sa rawata. Ken bal bali. Na turanga ngono na gai lako tiko maya na bali ni lotu ma maya lotu. Sa vutu ni yao rawatiko. Ka vutu zonga tuvua. Na ve kaeso sa asyanga ni ngani tiko eki na me lako buwana turanga. Sa vutu ni yao rautu, ena iwala wala kena mbula ni lotu. Kena karua, kwa na dhorobo vutu, dhorobo ndokumuna na ibaka dhapa dhapa. Wana rede kwa ya laga mwa ilinga lala saranga. Senga saranga ni dhona kaa etubwa, mera ni baure mwa loma alagi, mea kawa ina yaloka ni mwata iloma alagi, ki mwana dhorobo iwala wala dhago. Ya, kila, oya na italo ni chisu, mea mbuletira una ruwago. Kila, oya talanga nono dito wana tamati ni kuwa. Elimu nono nono kawa inga beira, kwa elimu nono kaya tigo beira, era elimu nono kaya rao ni rata kama, mea ibuwa endua. Eto mba le tunga mbaka bita alia, eto nga mbaka ndua. Ya, o chisu ya kaya, sa kalunga ta koira, sa nrabu nrabuwa mbaka yalo. Se, blessed are the poor in spirit. Ya, narara mbuni talo nono enda sa arida rawa, oni bina kata me darede vita na ka. Ken mutai, oya, na nrabu nrabuwa mbaka yalo, endua, E vakila wakata ki koya ni gandreba me vaka sinaiti vaka yalo. E vakila ni senga saranga ni dona kae tuwa. Me rao ni reyma ena mata ilo malagi e mata vinaka ka vaka dondu i koya. Kene karua ni kao ni vinakata me dareda e anango nungo o ya o irango era rey vua na kalou kara gandreba me rao vaka vuti ni autaki me vua na kalou. Kene katolu na lagi lagi ni iloloma e suleviro karisto baleta Nira sa wakila, nira turanga, marama, dhorobu, ngwane lewa, nrabu nrabuwa, waka yalo. So, tathiku nganegu. Yanda singa lemu nikuwa, obe suretiko, rongo dhana kaya vya kaya vya kaya vya turanga, enda indai. Yanda italano e rua, watake na rarama, ni vuna ube na uli vonua, e kaya tiko chisu. Kira matai, vya kalamani. O ira, era lewa ni mata ni tuni kalou, matai ni kaya, kaya vya ira na turanga, Oya, me wakila na tamata ya ndundua na nona ngangandri waka yalo. Me wakila ni siyaki ni nduna kae tuwa. Me wakasara nga na dhorobo dokumona na ibaka dhaba dhaba ngo. Kana tikina tina katolu. Asa tu waka yawa kokoya na kumuna na ibaka dhaba dhaba. Kala wakala maini. 
Na thurumu ko rodo ge lo ko mai sakila ko esa ka sara dinduna ka etu ko linga ko rodo ko tu mai buana kalu. Esa ka dinduna ka vina ka e rani rei mo lo ma lagi be ka wai ga i reda di rau di lo maniau. Na thing zara ngana ka tu wana thurumu ko. Na zaka zaka vina ka manta ngai no numo ko e di sambu zaka marau. Esa ka di ai li buana ka e ka wai sia. Ni no mundo i walo walo dundonu. E mo ka na tanga di butu butu ko e nda butu i ka tu ma. Kala ma kala mani. Oh, be kaya biko. Siyang dinang ayon dunang kaya tuwi kenda. Menda kau tubuwa na kalo. Merani ato kina na nona bibang donui na kalo. Merani ato kina na nona mata lalo mamay na kalo. Be kenda. Balata ni da tamata i walo walo da. Balata ni da tamata duka. Tamata druka. E da dunang be kenda na tamata i walo walo da. E na be singa kena be bongi. Meu kila vakilatiko. No yaw. Au nga drevi chisu undi na bagayalo. Au nga drevi na nona bibang koko taki. Au nga drevi na nona bila veti. Au nga drevi na nona vetu meri que não nos bula, não nos dará que é muito tu aqui, o rico, o ateque, o não liga na boca tem que buscar ser limpo, tem que nem dua, na boca tem que buscar ser limpo, tem que nem dua, seu tal tala, seu dau bunau, seu leoni loto ele ganha, não nada, agora cai cai bem com, na boca tem que buscar, agora não envolve nem cá o iatama, é nesse que são bulé que não na tamata na calou, são bulé coé me uzu e na calou, bulé iatama pode cair e rou uzu e na calou, só sudo na levian rau Tiga ni ruah. Asam buli rau menduna tengah ni kan duna elawa. Asam bosan bawa kalung kita tak kira. Kau bawa tukar naya dan rau nata mata ini singa kan buli rau kita. Tiga ni tulu. Asam bulu kau ada, maka duna rau kau tulu singa bulu lebaki. Sangai sudu enduna lubian nata tengah ni. Asa udui koya. Sa singa udui nata kalau sa udui ada ma. Kasa itu bawa tak kaya. Kasa bawa ya dan koya kosedi. Na thamuna mune kaya kina na kalou ni o seithi e sudhu sa sega na udhuya atama sa sega na udhuya na kalou sa udhuya atama nga. Na mwana ngo. Baleta, ni nge mwe kune kune na ngone ngo sa mwe kune kune taki e na kete i wala wala dha. Kien mwana bale, na i wala wala dha ni nge tara i seithi sa sega wala nga ni tara na kaya dhakava e tara na kaya. Kuli ni yangu, etarana lewe ni yangu, etarana sui ni yangu, bau kina na uru ni yangu. Kena mwana pali, na ivala mwala dha, na kata uzoko, dango, dango, ta uzoko, etu dha ketungo, sa tara na ivala mwala dha, bau kina na vika ambula. Gwana mwana kaya kino chisu, sa kalunga ta koira, era vakilati kori na ramu, ramu wa bagayalo. Baleta, era rani yadho na ngao, na me vaka thalai na vaka asamu ni tamata, me unanuma, ni saharao ni sona ka asamu toko miyeo, me ukoto me mwa na kalou, me adho kina nona vipa kondo nui kina nona lola mwa na kalou. Rungadha, sabi wa sa ilimu sanga mwulukan duwa, tikina ilima. Raitha, ka wa sudhu vata keina dha. Ka sa kune kune ta kia uko tinangu, ena i wala wala dha. Temi te kila ta langa. Tunggu nak kaya, saya nak kete, saya sudah mai kena, saya kuno kuno tak kena, nak kete, saya tahu binduka, saya tahu binruka, saya tahu bida. Kena mana balik? Nak wake up tahu tak? Kau membeli ti tebita, saya bawa bawa dah. Nak kaya wakar sama tak? Nak bunuh saya bezi ria kikina, nak nak wakar nanu, nak 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 kaya wakila, waktu kena engkau, saya tahu binduka, kau tahu bida. Kira ni lepak muda lah tak kau pula, saya kau kau sar. Na kende tuba kena tamata vya kalamani. E na Roma, wa seono ti kine rosa kubulu. Roma dha. Ni dhou sa bom bulatiko kine i wala wala dha. Dhou ayawa tu kine i wala wala dodonu. Roma dha. Dhou sa bom bulatiko. E dha sa nona bom bula na i wala wala dha. Kene mal balea. E dha nona turanga na i wala wala dha. O sanga ni rao ni o dingi dingi tani mwe na i wala wala dha. Ia, e na vuku i karisto. Sana rao ni mwaka mulu mulu mutaki na kau kau wa ni dha. E yu mwaka kati kumye kuna kende tuba kina tamata. E nda bombula ni wala wala dha. Tiki na itini karua. Kwa ya menda gai kakua ni guma tuwa. Na i wala wala dha. E nda yungu mundo usa mati rao. Matai e nda bombula ni wala wala dha. Kende karua. Kana kende wande wa walangi. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Na tui ye veli utaki. Na ivala vala dha e nonda turaga sin is our master. Na ivala vala dha e nonda tui sa aliu teki kenda. Wase vidu tiki nero sanga mulu katolu. Ia ka wakune e nduata nei vuna wene veti kiyungu. Haro sa viva la ke nei vuna u sa atu e na lomangu. Asa vaka bombulo tekeo ke nei vuna uni dha. O koe sa atiko e na veti kiyungu. Ke nei katolu. Na ivala vala dha e lawa. E turaga e tui e lawa. O yuko mati keyao. Sabit kini wala wala dha. 
Bobul ni volvolada. El liu teki kenda ni volvolada. Salawa ni volvolada. Ya gere da no puno basi ka moe kino na turanga. No na basi ka moe na turanga. No na viona kato koe me vaga bol molu mutai ka koe na turanga koe sa vaga tule wati go. Me vaga bol molu mutai ka koe na tui koe sa vaga liu teki ti go. Me kavoro ka basuraki na lawa koe sa ti go. Me rawa ni viso teki na turanga me sa turango chisu. Viso teki na tui me sa tui o chisu. Viso teki na lawa na lawa ni mate ni tui ni kalou. Me sa lawa ni no na mule ni dora tamata tabuyani. Oh, mereka lemah ni. Tetok kan ni talon ogo. Mula tak kaya tiga cisu. Sa kalau kata, kau irasan rambu-rambu apa gaya lo. Oh, iko mati kaya utang dia ku kane ku. Yang ada visi ga. Yang tentu dia wakil hati ku. Dia utamata rambu-rambu. Dia utamata dha. Dia yang utok karo tunggu. Isi ni dora kami nak itu kena. Yang ada gaya binaka nga. Kaya sabah si kemana nanti dia buka bula. Yang ada gaya binaka nga. Kaya maka sa vila utang dia kena. Dia turang. Yang ada bula yang ada bola-bola dah, yang ada tiko yang ada lama ni bola-bola dah, kata saya tiko ko yang ada bura-bura ini bola-bola dah. Ya betul mana? Biar nak kita buka, nak kita buka. Kena keruak. Nika, orang nak kata, mana ada nasi gelebe dendai? Oh ya, oh ira era drama drama buah buah lo, era rai tiko buah nak kalau berrau ni rambo ke but ni ya utak ni buah lo. Oh sama sama tu bego nak kita buka, nak kita buka, nak kita buka. Kuda kuda tak kena kete ibal ibal dah? Ko susu ene susu susu, ko susu ene susu susu ibal ibal dah? Enda bombulan ibal ibal dah? Nanti turangan ibal ibal dah? Enda nanti tui ibal ibal dah? Salawan ibal ibal dah? Ia, eh kau bukan cisu eh day day? Oh ira ira wakilah ni tu wakil go? Ni review nak kata ni review buat ni otak? Erna rate go buat ni tui ni tui ni turang ni turang. Oh cisu karisto ni kalmani. Oh kau yang go? Erna kau temai? Na buat ni awu bayalo. Rongga dana kene talon ona doru bawa uaya. Kau bago? Nanti kene tin kau bawa? Aku sa kau bikin do? Sa laku sobu kena nona vale na temata ungo? Sa wakat donui? Kau nana laku mai laku lingan lala sana kau mai? Non ang kagani mo aso lang ha? Kako ay buwan naturang ha? Ni lo mani yaw may. Ni usa tamata ay wala wala da. Ay asar ka na kako titi ko may buwan na kalung. Sa kilaw ko ya, kaya mga tautaki ay nakaw the kawa na mata ni tuni kalaw mo lewe na. O ay usa sa sarang doon kaya na yan. Na fire riso ay ano bulo. Ay ano mata ni tuni kalaw mo kalmani. Kaya mga tautaki ay nanon da thaka thaka. Na mata ni tuni kalaw yung bulo na fire risi. Mulat. O ko ya, thaka doon da ka may view ko ya. Na doro po ugo. Iya. Bola tu ni bawa tau taki ena lolo mai cisu karisto, ena bawa tau taki ena kado donga sulian turang beir nata mata, beir ko mati keau, ko yang go siroki ena nona balle, selaku kene nona balle, na dorbogo ena singo ya, ena lako mama rau, bola tu kilau ko ni sa mosoti, kilau ko ni sa bawa donui, ena lako mato mai nona izolo izolo ni lenga, ni gay lesu, nona izolo izolo ni lenga, sa mai bawa lu Mga lutubi, yan ang matay karisto. Yan lang ko po tamay na nun ang ramun-rabua. Yan lang ko po tamay na nun ang boy dha. Yan lang ko po tamay na nun ang duka velu-velu. Yan lang ko po tamay na nun ang rey-rey dha. Iya, sa suka na maraw, sa suka na bodhegu, baleta, ni kilaw ko ya, sa view na katikoya, o lo malangi. Kilaw ba kalamay, niyo ko mati kayaw, ni kuwa, ni darutuda kaya na matay velu ay ni kalaw. E dikleta ko lo malangi, you are guilty of sin. O guilty ena ibal bal da. Ia, vaga bini bina kami cisu karisto. Marau, baleta. Ena gak unsur nga. Ena vaga tulewat aku kini allah malagi new guilty new tu mata ibal bal da. Ena vuno gay takus kini cisu nono dewa bul. Ena gune takus kini gay kaku. Oi kau musa vaga lalai sana kedua. Oya usana luwat terano mui sulu di ibal bal da. Sana tokaro cisu karisto. Merau ni zabeta kini nana uli muno ni gabo boka. Sange luwat aku ano nui sulu di allah tu tu. Ena vaga sulu bi ku kini. Mora ni allah ko ena galala. Ano mo na makalaman ni Saru ibibiki na nabesing o yung mga mga kaya o may wakilati ko na noong daro bulan daro daro buwa mga kaya o daro nga nga yung duwa yung wusimi dake may mga puti niya utay kaya daro e sanga niyo na kunia e na ilamo o sanga niyo na kunia e na may mga toro dake taki e na sanga niyo na kunia e na kadadawal e tu e na rugi ni mata ni singgo e na kunia doon doon nga e na rugi ni kobal tayo rugi ni doon mga dada na magsawati na kaya may nakabu at Jesus Christo Kau yang kau yang bawa putih ni utak ayat, dona temata. Merau ni laki butuh kina, ena longa kola, longa siliva, kau yang egeri-geri tu, 
di bata di tu di kalau saya di gaul di salah di kalau sa kalau ngata koir era sa drum drum buah bengal kalau bengal mad nanti dia ngah di nonton rota di tiga mobil cisu nanti dia ngah di nonton yalita di tiga mobil cisu ya telinga Enda saka itu kau baru turang turang ayuh sih dengan driviku, ayuh sabu tu ni ayutiku, sarutia ayuh nak kasih hati gua biaw, mebaca no faris oya, lagu mebe cisu, lagu batu tu mebe batu kena nona beg, nona idol idol, sa sinai, sa butu ni ayuh, sa kaku turang ayuh sih dengan kata gaya, sih dengan kata gaya, gua nak kau kau tiku mai, ayuh sa butu ni ayutu, mebaca lo mani, kau cisu sa kalungata, kau ira sa drum drum buah bagai alo, spiritually indeed, kira ketolu, ni baca samu, menon dan aku nongo. Eh anak kain lo lo mah deh deh re, eh bagai rota kan aku lom, menon re, oira, eh wakila ni re bulan ramu ramu apa ya lo, orang kata, sa kalau kata kau ira sa ya lo bul bulumu, spiritually pua, ni sa non re, mati ni tu, walau malang, kalau mati ni tu ni kalau untuk vital mata kita kau mengko, kayo kau ya, eh non re, oira, eh ramu ramu apa ya lo, ni dua sa apa kau mata utak kau men ramu ramu apa ya lo, buru buru kau bekal mani. Enak baca butuh dia untuk lagi kau yang lama lagi. Enak baca itu buat lagi kau yang lama lagi ni itu buat dia dari. Enak itu buat wujud. Enak baca itu buat buat lagi kau yang ini buat buat dia dari dua dua. Di mana buat ini tu kau yang baca rotan kan aku lupa nama nama kita langgan. Enak kau kau baca yalo kerap bulat bulat di nak baca yalo. Baca lama ni. Kau ini kau yang dua nak nak itu. Kira buat ini tu ni kalau. Oh besar itu kan aku dah sarang aku. O katiko mota mata drum drum buah bayalo. O katiko munda sila bibi woro. Ena mata ni kalau merani bagai butu ni uta kiko Kristo. Ena bulu bagai loma lagi. Ena itu bagai loma lagi. Ena itu bagai kalau kena bulu bagai kalau. Pro ni talno itu ni boleh tahu. Dua talno tak aisyah, dua talno tak ko Paula. Ena Filipai. Aisyah talno tak awas itu ni kapa? Nai talno ke Lucia fana kalau kalau ibu le singa. Mai lama lagi, nanti tiga mai lama lagi. Waktu kita nak agai aduh war, orang ada nak kaya tu guna kau. Isa, nampu lutu mai lama lagi. Kau ikut lusi, apa nak kalau kalau boleh singa, nampu tapa kau boleh sob, kena gelle. Kau ikut kau sahdo, bawa seorang rata karena biar mati ni tu. Ia kau akai lama mu. Kau nak zat zat ke kilo lama lagi? Kau nampu zat zat rata karena kau itu itu. Me zat zat kalau lebih ran, kalau kalau ni kalau. Kau nanti kau telaga, nampu lima dua tamu. Kau nak tiga telinga, anda dah ni uli bodoh di songgoni, anda tiki nak kita tukalau, kau nak zat bikin kita sana kita kaki, mana kira nawo? Ia kau nak tutu pada kaya sah, dia dah resara, kaya nak tiga nanti kelim, kaya wana kalau, ia kau nak bius sembunga kita tesi, kita tiki nak kaya sana bul bulu, kau nak tala no endua, anda buku di kaya bukan sulubi kau kira nak kalau melo malangi, sana rumah kau ni sah butuh ni aku kandung nak, endua ni bul bulu walangan, ni lagi di kalau. Belah tembaga ni, daun di bawah tangi lew, daun di ser lew, belah tembaga. Nai wuku wuku tali, wuku tu kau ikir, apa tu kira bunuh? Bagi tiko ni kau ikir nak kalau, sana rumah kau ni, ni sah butuh ni aku kerja kerja tak? Ya kena rau, kau yang go, yang gay bagi siwa itu ni kira kau yang orang itu tu. Kau ikir anda, oh Asia, ni gay kau yang nak kalau, kau nak biu semua kaki atas, kira tiki na, kira seni bul bul. Talno Paul, biar tu boleh feel pain. Kakak, beti ko enak lama mundo, naya longo kati ko be Kristo. O ko ni sayi tobo bate ke nak kalau, sa seng ni bakasa mo ni sa mutaku, kasa baka tau tu bata ni ke nak kalau, asa baka drum drum bote ki ko ya, kakak tu bua nai tobo ni tematan tau biang gerabi, asa tak bete tau tu bate ke nai tematan, ini sayi ku ini sayi tobo bate ke nai tematan, sa baka bulu bulu bote ki ko ya, asa tali rau rau memati, memati nak kau belatai, o ko yang go sa baka lebu lebu i ko ya dake ke nai nak kalau, sa si lebu a endone ya dake, wo si bi dake, enai ya dake ke dengah, rendah rau ni talno. Dua kau kau ti kau yang dah kena buku di kaya sah tu buah kena kaya sah rawat. En dua, mana zezere lagi lagi tu tu zezere dua dua tu kena lumi di kalau, dawai buli, ti kau ena ti kena tabu mai lama lagi, ya kaya ni bul tabu, dengai dawai kalau besiro, talno tak kau pola, mana kalau kena temata, temata kena dawai gerabi, dawai gerabi meja do serangan kena kau belatai. Dua zaman tak ke, dua sirosom. Eklah, na lembu ni dona sirosom bo Kristo. Mea zaman serangan na bulu-bulu kalau kita mati, kaya na tiki na ti ziwa. O koyo go sabaka lembu-lembu i koyo tak ke kira nak kalau. 
Due shiro, due dhabidhaki. Viko potikia uta viko kanegu. Yani shingile uwe dai dai. Shana nga uno ngo. O mese no itiko na mungu ni rara mungu ni kalu. O katiko mungu 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 yalo. Kauti yiko somu. Venga una tau doko. Vanga tara mungu ndo uvili mula tamu. Vanga tara mungu ndo umasu. Vanga tara mungu. Vosa tiko vye yiko na turanga na venga una. Mula tangori. Yana vanga rara mungu tanga tiko na umu ilanga lako. Yana vukebe vanga vutu ni ya utake na mbulo ngo. Yana mbulo mga loma langi. Kena ito mga loma langi. Lako mwe chisu karisto. Lako mwe yana nrubu nrubua. Lako mwe yana lubo iwale. Lako mwe yana kemu itu maki. Vanga sisilo saraga. Eredi yiko kino setani. Oloma lagi, yana vanga sulubiko. Oloma lagi, yana vanga tutubita kiko. Yana levetiko, moyado. Mo, dheveredake, kalako. Watike yikoye, kina matini tu, sala ke vanga rotaka. Kaya na gangani seri. Obola tingo, na nona seri. Yendu, e vakilano, na dramu dramu vanga yalo. Kaya kwa autorovi ke muni. Ni usa linga lalatu. Ni lo mani ya wendai. Ni usa lenga karawai. Mo ni sabai ya wendai. Me usa agai vanga bulai. Ni na woti nga era. Au na lako nga buwa. Ki na koro mwekea. Koro kosa yoni vuhu. Ulu vatu ko chisu. Au sa ndro veke muni. Nungu masu. Mo na dansila batike karisto ya kovel tai. Mo ndro dhabe batike koya. Me adho. Ki na sayo ni vuhu. Turanga ni mami kalou. Awa maso na mungu ni tavingu nga nengu rango ya dheotiko ni singe lemu ni kuwa. Ndere ira ya lemu na kaya mga songo na tuya na nona mbula. Kana numa ni saa vanga putu ni ya utaki kwe tiko kina. Ya ni mami kalo, numa ni vosa kaya mweke mami ni kuwa. Ni kalo ngata, okoye saa ya lo bulbo lumbo, okoye ndasila, bibi voro, okoye endramu ndrabuwa mga ya lo. Kavakila, ni tiko na nona nga ngandre, ya nga ndrevi kimi ni. Ni mweke 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 Ni kundi buweti ke imami ka mwana samu sabata ke imami Kundi rokobi do do nga sisu ni mwana Amen Global Youth Day 2021, we ask you to reach out to others, to reach those of different cultures, colors, and communities. For Global Youth Day 2022, we're challenging you to love the forgotten. Are there any members of your community that perhaps have been neglected? Are there any church friends that you haven't seen in a while? When was the last time you connected with them and showed them love? All good deeds are worth nothing if we don't remember to love. So this Global Youth Day, Start by loving the forgotten.